Hello, son and daughter. Welcome to Old Texas Scare Podcast. I've always found solace in the loneliness of the Alaskan waters, the endless expanse of ocean, the harsh cry of the gulls, the bitter bite of the wind. They were more than just parts of my job as a fisherman. They were pieces of my soul. That's why when my boat, the Sea Whisperer, crashed against an unseen rock during a particularly vicious snowstorm, I felt more than just fear. I felt a profound betrayal. The snow was falling in heavy, suffocating blankets, turning the world into a blinding whirl of white. Panic clutched at my throat as I struggled to free myself from the wreckage. My boat was more than just a vessel. It was my livelihood, my home. Now it lay in ruins, swallowed by the merciless Alaskan sea. I managed to drag myself onto a flow, gasping for breath, my body numb from the icy grip of the ocean. I knew I had to find shelter and fast. Hypothermia was a silent stalker in these parts. Stumbling through the blizzard, I searched for any sign of refuge. That's when I first heard it, a deep, guttural sound that seemed to resonate with the howling wind. I froze every instinct screaming that I wasn't alone. Through the curtain of snow, I caught glimpses of a massive, shadowy figure. It was like nothing I'd ever seen. Towering covered in thick, matted fur with eyes that glowed with a primal intelligence. At first I thought I was hallucinating, that the cold had finally seized my mind. But as the creature stepped closer, its enormous form became unmistakably clear. It was like the Bigfoot from the stories. But this one was real, breathing and standing mere feet from me. A part of me wanted to run, but my legs were leaden, frozen, not just by the cold, but by an overwhelming sense of awe. The creature cocked its head studying me with a curiosity that was almost human. Then, with a grunt, it turned and began to walk away. Inexplicably, I followed it. Maybe it was desperation, the instinct to cling to any form of life in this frozen wasteland. Or maybe it was the silent call of something ancient and unknown, a siren song luring me deeper into the wild. The creature led me through the blizzard, its massive form cutting through the snow effortlessly. After what felt like hours, we arrived at the mouth of a cave. He entered, and I followed him. Once in the I lost him. It's just like he disappeared into thin air. Very weird, but I swear it was real. My stepdad lived in Virginia when he was around the age of eight, right on the edge of the great dismal swamp. According to him, he was in bed one night when the sky was cloudless or just very bright. He never thought until recently whether the moon was shining or not, and saw a beast looking right through his window at him. He said he could see spittle running down its face and its eyes were looking straight at him. It was supposedly standing on its hind legs and had cream, red, and brown-colored matted fur and a face almost like a wolf. Other than its snout, its facial features were very human. Its jawbones were high, the structure around its eyes and its eyes themselves were human. Esquire, the coloring of its eyes, he believes, were yellow. The reason why I think this is interesting and possibly valid is because the Great Dismal Swamp covers a huge amount of territory and is hardly touched by human. Only in recent years have people started to study its inhabitants. The grounds are wet, mossy, and absorb sound, and people have been known to wander into it and never return. Who knows what could be lurking in the unknown? Chills my bones. Oh, yeah. I forgot to mention that he crawled out of his bed and went straight to his mother's room. In the morning, when they looked around the house, all the windows had ground that was stirred up under them, and grass that was yanked out. There were actual scratches in the wood under his window, and paint was missing too. However, as far as they could see, there were no discernible footprints. I was hunting during doe season in the woods. 
I parked my truck on a side road in Washington County, but it was right on the border, near Green County. Anyway, I was in a tree stand, looking for deer and heard a lot of rustling leaves near me. I then saw this wolf-like thing running on its hind legs. It stopped for a moment, sniffed the air, and then ran off. I sat in that tree stand for hours, till the sun was high in the sky. Then I cautiously returned my truck. I gave up hunting after this experience. I've been debating on sharing this story with anyone outside of my small circle of people that were there, but I want to share my experience in hopes that it saves someone's life or to give understanding of what someone else has experienced. Late fall 2010, in northern Canada, I went deep into the wilderness with my father and my eldest brother to hunt for moose. We left in the early morning, just before sunrise, trying to cover as much distance as possible before nightfall. We traveled winding rivers and had to repeatedly portage over rapids all day. We decided to set up camp just over halfway to our destination. My father figured that we'd make the rest of the journey tomorrow. Well, when everyone bedded down for the night, I decided to go grab some firewood and relieve myself down by the bank of the river, just out of reach of the light from the campfire. Out from the tree line, about 15 yards away, I could hear rustling in the bushes. I watched the area where I heard the noise and focused on that spot. I felt kind of funny, dizzy or lightheaded, and I could smell this putrid stink like old milk or rotten food. Then I saw the trees start to morph and move ever so slightly and began to take the shape of a head and slight facial features. My eyes began to adjust it to the darkness and along the tree line. I could hear this voice coming from there. I recognized it, the voice sounded like one of my relatives who had recently passed. The face took shape of my relative. Hello, they said, I've missed you. Come see me, I smiled and stepped forward a bit, but stopped to analyze the situation. My relative's face stopped smiling and became emotionless. The skin began to turn pale and peel away. Chunks of flesh from their cheeks began to fall away, and I felt shock and fear overwhelm my body. I couldn't make sense of it at all, so I started to back away and make my way to camp. I didn't realize at the time that I had been walking towards the voice, and I was further away from the firelight. The voice became angry and began shouting at me to come here, so I turned to run away. But as I looked back one more time, I saw the most disgusting thing I had ever seen. It was rotting flesh on gnawed bone, caved-in eyes, and a hollow chest cavity. This humanoid creature was tall and super thin. I ran as fast as I could, trying to yell for help, but the fear had made my voice quiet and raspy. I ran along the riverbank, and I could hear the heavy breaths and the stomping feet from this thing right behind me. I made it onto the top of the riverbank, but it grabbed a hold of my leg as I jumped up. I gripped and tore the grass, trying to lift myself, and yelled as loud as I could. Then finally my voice came back, and I yelled that someone has my leg. My brother woke up and ran over to where I was. Then he pulled me up and took me over to the fire. I was terrified, trying to explain what I saw and that it looked like my relative but not. I was trying to convince them that I wasn't seeing things, but my brother nodded his head and said I saw it too. I know. That solidified it. He acknowledged that it was real. We stayed up all night after that. Rifles loaded and close by. We packed up when the sun was coming up and went back home. We haven't shared that story with anyone out of fear of being labeled as crazy or liars. I've had nightmares and couldn't sleep for months afterwards. I would see things or dark figures looking into my window or hear whispers when I was walking home at night. Eventually, I was seeing this dark figure daily. I went to medicine men or shaman for help, but I've learned that the ceremonies only relieves it temporarily. Friends have given me everything from protection pouches to certain crystals. I found out that there's a strong possibility that I encountered a wendigo. I learned that if you encounter one and survive, it attaches itself to you like a parasite. I learned that it could only do this if it touches you, which it did. 
Ever since that night, I've been on edge when I enter any forest or wooded area, which sucks, because I love being outdoors or hunting and in nature. Now, I always feel like I need to keep my back against something when I'm out in the wild. Anyways, make your own conclusions about this. I've paid a price for being an ignorant child to the stories of old. They are real. I can attest to that. Stay safe, everyone. This happened when I was seven years old. I'm sharing it because my older brother reminded me of it. And now that I'm 24, I can't get it out of my head. This was very traumatic for me because after this event, a bunch of other things started to happen. This is how it started. Growing up and even now, I live in a haunted state and I lived five miles away from the most notoriously haunted forest. My mom used to tell my brothers and me about what she would hear while walking by the forest, the murders that happened, and how she used to see puke wedges. My older brother, uh, 11 at the time, let's call him Dan, and I, 7 female, were watching TV in the living room. It was dark outside. It must have been a new moon. If you were sitting on the couch and looked to your right, you would see the glass sliding door which had a view of the backyard. Mind you, it was an acre lawn with tall trees lining the perimeter. I was tired and decided to get my ritual glass of milk before bed when I stood up and saw what was glaring at me through the glass door. It was tall, taller than the door itself. It was skinny in the torso, but its chest was broad. It was white with tall ears. I want to say it looked like the white version of Donnie Darko. I was about 15 feet from the glass door. I froze. It didn't move. It just kept looking at me. It could not have been anyone else because we lived in the middle of the woods. I started calling for my brother's name, but Dan wasn't answering me. I started to get louder, now calling for my mom. Her room was on the other side of the couch, so she was there in a heartbeat. She looked at the back door, then at Dan, and then told me to just sit back down. I couldn't understand why I was the only one freaking out. I lay on the couch, facing away from the glass door. Dan put a blanket on me, and we both fell asleep on the couch. Well, in 2020, one Dan called me from jail. He's been in and out since I was 13. This is how the conversation went, Dan. Hey, can I ask you something? Me. What's up, Dan? Do you remember that night? Me. What night, Dan? That night where you were freaking out. We were young. Remember that tall, scary-looking thing that was at the back door? Me? I had a flashback of that night. Dan. Look, I had a dream about it last night, and I wanted to tell you that I saw it too. I was too scared to do anything. Mom saw it also. The conversation ended because he only had so much time on the phone. I felt relief knowing I wasn't just having a schizophrenic hallucination episode, but my body went numb from the memory of being so scared. I told my significant other about it. He's my best friend. My significant other told me that I came face to face with a Wendigo, and he wasn't surprised because of the small country town I lived in. When I looked up what a Wendigo was, my heart sank. That's what I saw. Now, I think about it every day. It's been a year since I was reminded of it. I believe it still follows me. September 1993. One night, several of my Marine Corps infantry platoons were doing some training exercises just outside of our base camp. As we all sat around the fire pit right after dinner, one of my men looked out into the darkness and claiming to see a shadow moving in the trees only 50 feet away from us. He watched it for a while before safely turning back and asking me if I had noticed anything strange. Myself, I had not. The next day, we came back and searched that area looking for anything, but found nothing unusual at all. However, on the third day, we went back, and one of our members was walking along when he realized there was something behind him. He turned around quickly, only to find nobody was there. At this point, everybody had begun wondering what it could be. 
it couldn't be seen at all, but they could feel its presence. One night later on, after the previous events had taken place, I was walking around with one of my other Marines, discussing how strange this thing was, when all of a sudden we realized that whatever it was that was following us earlier had now begun to walk parallel with me. I dropped one knee quickly and let loose two quick shots into the darkness, hoping to scare off whatever it was for good. But whatever it was didn't move or flinch. It just kept walking like nothing happened. At this point, none of us were too scared, though, so any feelings of fright were now pushed back down below conscious thoughts. As we walked back towards the main camp compound, we never could figure out what it was. But I still think about it once in a while. I hope one day we can solve the mystery surrounding this black apparition that walked with us on our training exercises ever so silently. I know what a bear looks like, especially when they stand on their hind legs. This thing was far from anything considered normal. Well, in order to comprehend what I've been through, I'm going to have to go back to when I was 17 years old. Four years ago, in the middle of spring, I was on my break from school doing nothing productive like any teenager, but to my excitement I was invited to venture to the Sierra Nevada mountains alongside my grandfather and Uncle Tom. And so I agreed, and the very next day we took to the mountains. An hour into the trip, and I'm not the least bit bored because I was gazing through the lens of my camera, taking hundreds of photos of the tree-covered mountains. We arrived in the Wishing Reservoir, about 78 miles away from Fresno. We stopped by the dam for a quick bathroom break. As I went to use the restroom, I noticed there were some attached portrait photos of random individuals displayed upon a large pin board before the bathroom door. About ten or more photos were pinned there, and they all looked new. I never really liked looking at those faces, faces of people who had a life before being stolen by some sick people. Before we left, I remember the last few words my mother spoke of. She said something like, you stick close to Grandpa and Uncle Tom no matter what. You boys better keep an eye on my baby boy. That was always the case with my mother whenever I go out to the wilderness. She had always been uneasy about the forests. Bad hiking trip manual, Grandpa tells me when I asked that day, not caring to put much detail in that story. The most I heard from that story was that a hog got a good bite off my mother's leg when she was just eight years old, but I always speculated if there was something bigger behind that tale. At the time, there was nothing to be afraid of. Besides, we were packing some serious heat. We carried four of revolvers, two 12-gauge shotguns, and a well-preserved W2W2 Russian rifle, the Mosin Nagant, a weapon I have always dreamt of using. Around 3 p.m. in the afternoon, we are driving on this mountain, and Grandpa makes a left turn into this ancient dirt road. Eventually, we arrive at this partially open field with a few trees and rocks poking out. We parked close to the only exit, unpacked all of our gear, and set them out. From there, I analyzed the vastness of the field. The field space took up about 30 yards long and less than 50 feet. Wide, meeting a north, downward slope guarded with skin, piercing bushes. But around the end looks to be a hidden foot, path leading into the forest. Beyond this ground is nothing more but pine trees surrounding every inch of this field. It gave off this ancient look. In fact, that entire land is a private area owned by the state itself. This land was not to be touched at all. Otherwise, we would suffer from heavy fines. As soon as Grandpa told me this, I got a little worried, but Grandpa was there to remind me that everything was going to be all right. He always had a way of calming me down. He was good at that. For the rest of the afternoon, we spent it eating before embarking on a hike through the slope. The slope was not difficult to pass through, for there are plenty of spaces left for us to walk. The hike turned out incredible. I got to take many pictures out of the forest. But while we were returning to our camp, I was following behind due to my attention being on the beauty of the wild, I found some footprints that closely resemble a human's foot, but 
bigger. The footprints were too big to be a human's foot, yet it resembled to a human's too well. The next imprint spaced between seven feet apart. Now I was about to take the picture, but I got the feeling that something was watching me, and it's closed. From what I saw, there was nothing around my perimeter, yet its presence was strong. I didn't want to stick around any longer, so I caught up with the guys. Soon the sun began to lower itself down the peak of the mountains. Darkness began to creep its way before the moon. We had to start a fire for light. The rest of our time was spent bonding over telling funny stories of my family and learning the basics of holding a gun. They gave me this tiny revolver while they got to use the rest. Small, yes, but it does offer a strong grip. By the time the moon arrived, the forest was already consumed by the night. The male crickets stridulate their wings for their female counterparts, and the entire black sky was blanketed with stars. It was truly a beautiful night and the right way to relieve stress. It was now 9 p.m., and we were all chilling out in the cool air. Uncle Tom was out smoking a joint in the blackness of the trees, while Grandpa and I sat separated around the campfire gazing up in the stars. Some time passed and Grandpa asked me a question that I will forever change my life. Manuel, what do you know about Bigfoot? From there on, Grandpa tells me the true story of my mother's horrific incidents she received as a child. Somewhere down south in these similar woods, my then mid-aged grandfather took his wife at the time and my toddler mother out for a hike. Everything was going swell until the next day of their arrival. The family went out for a nice hike and something attempted to abduct my mother when there was no supervision around, but to my relief, Grandpa reacted fast. I hear your mother's scream coming from the trees. I tell Maria to stay put while I run into the woods. I ended up coming to a clear enough opening where I got a chance to see who took my daughter, about forty yards away from me. I see this thing dragging little Rosie across the forest. It looked like some kind of ape with reddish-brown hair all over its body, but it looked huge. Looked to be about eight feet or higher, and it was fast. Real fast. With a little time I had left, I drew my special revolver the most powerful handgun in the world. I take aim and I fire. You wasted him? I asked with great intentions. No, it lived, but I hit it all right. I hit that thing three times and the thing let out this horrible shriek of pain. It was so loud, so vigorous, I swear I fell on my ass when I heard that scream. The thing ran off looking injured. I never saw it again. What happened to Mom? Was she okay? Nah. Her right was bent out of place. She couldn't walk no more. Apparently, that thing pulled Rosie's leg so hard it snapped the leg out of place. Thank God she was strong enough to bear the pain. Just not enough afterwards. What do you mean? Your mother became mute for three years straight, and she became very nervous whenever she was alone. Hell, she even gets nervous around places with lots of trees. Damn. Yeah, it took her three years to finally utter some words. We were so happy that we got to hear her voice again. How exactly did she get taken? I, uh, I don't know. I tried asking how it happened, and she says she saw a red light flying around the trees, and when it got close to her, the thing popped out and grabbed her. Lights that turn into Sasquatch. That's a little hard to take in. Well, you don't have to take my word for it. I don't know how else to explain it for you. So you could go ahead and ask your mother what happened. Do you think she'll tell me everything? I don't know, Manuel. That was a very traumatic thing she went through. All right. It's not that I don't believe you, I believe you. It's just hard to process this. Same can be said for anybody who's seen what I've seen. Everyone is safe and they're tightly knit. Together life until they run into them. And just by one glance at these things, all your comprehensions in life are shattered. Not completely, but your views in politics and religion are challenged, and maybe that's a good thing. You gotta keep an open mind to stuff like this. Does Uncle Tom know any of this? No, I haven't told him. Besides, he's always skeptical about this kind of subject. 
He firmly believes that Bigfoot is just a hoax, so nothing will change his mind about it unless there is physical proof. Damn! A moment of silence had occurred between us until Grandpa got up and headed for the tent. I'm gonna head to bed. You coming? Asked Grandpa. After that, we put out the fire and all the lanterns and went to sleep in our tents, to be unbothered for now. Around 10, 9 p.m., we all slept in our tents that night, with enough room to store in three people, but Uncle Tom preferred to sleep on his own. His tent was set a few feet from us, but was still close enough to hear. I could not sleep that night because I was contemplating Grandpa's Bigfoot philosophy. All those broken branches and footprints that could definitely be a Sasquatch. And then it suddenly hit me that I should have told the guys what I saw. I thought, I will tell them what I saw tomorrow. Besides, the imprints looked a few days old. But that was even more discomforting considering there is something unknown to most people is lurking about. Eventually, I slept on my air-blown bed for a few hours before I would reawake again at 2, 20 a.m. I did not know why I woke up. I didn't feel like taking a piss or anything, but then I listened. It was quiet, too quiet. The bugs have stopped chirping, the trees held still for a questionable amount of time, and not a breath of air was emitted anywhere. I had every right to be concerned now. Hey, Manuel, you awake? whispered Grandpa. From his foldable bed, he slowly switches sides to face me. From the expression on his wrinkled brown face, he looked just as alert as I was. Yeah, I replied. Can you hear anything? No. We stayed there tuning in on the environment for about a minute. Grandpa then asked, You remember that gun I gave you? Yeah, it's in my bag. Get your hands on it, but don't shoot yet. Without hesitation, I reached in my bag for whipped out the little weapon, hand slightly shaking. Grandpa does the same, but pulls out a large shell revolver that completely dwarfed my pistol by comparison. Then we heard Uncle Tom's tent open and his footsteps nearing our position. Guys, it's me. Open up, he whispered. And so I unzipped the tent and he checked his surroundings before he spoke. Did any of you guys hear that breathing? Yeah, I did. That thing was going on for like five minutes, exclaimed Grandpa. Immediately I felt dread when I heard that phrase. Wait, I just woke up. There was breathing. Oh, man, who would want to mess with us? I begged my Grandpa. I don't know, but don't freak out. It might be mountain folks or some large animal. Now, Tommy, did you see anything out there? There's nothing. It's completely mute out there. But I did find some track. From right, he was about to finish. A small object hit his back as if someone threw it at him. Uncle Tom cursed when he picked it up. Dude, are you okay? I asked no. Someone threw this rock at me, shouted Uncle Tom, who was met with anger, confusion, and a little hint of fear. Grandpa orders me to pull out every electric lantern we had and set them everywhere. With what little light the moon provided us, our lantern's brightness made half of our campground seeable, but we still didn't have a clue of who threw that rock. We checked every corner while we can until, all of a sudden, we heard another thud coming from our north. A rock that could oversize a human hand, visually, was lying just a few inches away from the slope. When all of our lights met the slope, I was completely dread the second I realized what it could really be. The three of us slowly advanced to the slope's entry, anticipating for the better or the worse. We approached the slope and spotted nothing with our beams of light. Nothing but dirt, pine needles, and bushes. Grandpa, with his finger itching on the trigger of his gun, decided to call out the trespassers. Who's that stumbling in the dark? No responses, just the ever-deafening of the forest. This was it, I thought. We have this thing surrounded. Surely it would run away by now. Just as I was shining around the dark, I spotted something unusual on the ground. On the dirt, there was a pile of rocks, and next to them is the ground compressed by unknown weight. But when I focused on that spot a little more, I thought I saw a mottled outline of what appeared to be legs crouching down, all there but transparent. Suddenly, the invisible figure got up and ran away from us. It shook us all so bad we shot at point-blank range. 
It was gone now, but not for long. Grandpa demanded us to get to the car, and we started hauling ass. But just before we got inside, all the lanterns started blinking on their own. This just encouraged us more to move. We got inside, and Grandpa took off to the exit, regardless of all the gear we left behind. Luckily, the rest of our rifles were located in the back. Uncle Tom asks for a rifle, so without deciding, I chose the Mosin Magat, laid it, and passed it to him. Just as I was scanning my environment for that damn creature, the car pulled up to a stop all of a sudden, just before this path met the gray road to civilization. Dad, what the hell happened? Desperately asked Uncle Tom. I don't know, it just died, cried Grandpa as I saw him desperately trying to turn the car on. Before us, in the front of our vehicle, came this blinding orb of reddish-white light with a synthesized sound wave coming from the very orb. The orb began to transform into a large, oval-shaped disk, forcing us to cover our eyes from the brightness. Finally, the light darkened, but a hulking figure walked its way through the disk and the portal closed instantly, just as he landed. I couldn't believe it. It was a Sasquatch standing before us. The creature stood up, right to about eight feet tall and engulfed in dense dark brown hair, save for the hands, face, and chest. He was in great physical condition, and yes, I know it was a male. You can tell by seeing his chest. Not only was it jacked, it carried three aged bullet wounds and old scars too big for a bear to make. He had no neck, and his skull structure was large and sort of narrow and his face carried a mix of ape and human features with a beard outlined across his face. His eyes, though, presented vibrant red piercing through the dark. Too stunned to move, Grandpa gathered every bit of breath and yelled, Run! We did so and dashed back to the campground with nowhere else to go and the Sasquatch repeating his deep yelps and hoots. But as we ran, I heard the screams of my grandfather along with a series of strong snaps and cracks of metal. I cared, but not for the moment. I catch up with Uncle Tom catching his breath. I didn't know what to do or where to go, but Uncle Tom utters his last few words. Manual, hide. Get yourself out of here. I'm going to distract him he demanded, but his eyes carried much sadness and fear. No, not without you. Just go. I did what I was told, even if it was the hardest thing to do. I hid myself down the same slope, but hid myself deep in the trees, opposite the direction of the trail, and from there I waited, listening to Uncle Tom's last seconds. I hear his stumps approaching the campground, and it was met with a loud bang coming from the rifle Uncle Tom used. I couldn't hear anything else after the bang, but slightly muffled screams were the last things I heard before I felt a strong and short vibration underneath me. I waited there forever, not for my ears to recover, but afraid if it was still out there. I would feel some more vibrations coming from the beast, but he never seemed to get close to me. Eventually, there was no more walking I had forced myself to see. I peek my head over the slope and find nothing but the lifeless body of my uncle and the rifle lying next to him. When I examined him closer, I found him lying flat on the ground, limbs apart. My uncle's chest was caved in with bones from his rib cage poking out from the sides, blood drooling out of his mouth and chest, and his left eye popped out of his socket hanging alongside his face like a thread. Tears prevailed over my will not to cry. I only cried for a brief moment before getting back up. I took the rifle with me back down the only exit, where the jeep lay ahead, inanimate, with the front door open and blood smear and splattered all across the interiors. I found Grandpa's entire body shoved underneath the missing steer wheel with his bald head and arms sticking out, combined with his frightful expressions of pain written all over his face and small puddle of blood in the front seat. I refused to cry once more and ran on the road to civilization. Descending down from that mountain seemed like an eternal nightmare for me. I was clueless as to what to do and where to go. All I knew was the path we came from, but it didn't take long for the beast to find me again. He began taunting me with his alarming yelps and hoots, 
There was nothing to see but shadows and trees. I had no idea where to shoot. So I fired in point-blank range in all my surroundings. My ears go duff momentarily, but I still shoot, cursing at the creature to just take me on now. Get it over with already. Soon the violence ended when I noticed a speck of light coming from down the road. I didn't know if I should trust this light, knowing what it might be, but thankfully it was just a car. I could even hear the engine. Relieved, but still under stress, I ran towards the cars to meet the patrollers and have them take me away. After that night, I was sent to the hospital, and I was met by two nameless men in business suits. They ordered me not to tell anyone the truth of what transpired that night, only to identify the creature as a bear. Naturally, I got pissed and argued with them, but they won with intimidation. Four years have passed, and my road to recovery still goes on. I am no longer dependent on drugs or afraid of my shadows, but I still shiver in slight fright whenever I see a great herd of trees. To this day, I haven't opened up about the night with anyone but my mother until now. Eventually, the abductions began to slow down shortly after a year, but reported sightings of an evasive humanoid remain strong in Sierra Nevada. I don't know when I'll get back up in those mountains, but when I do, that thing better be ready for me. Because when I come by and I find him, I will not hold back. My father grew up in the Pleasanton or Christine areas of Texas, which is about 20-30 miles south of San Antonio, in the Texas brush country. The Texas brush country is a huge part of South Texas. It's not necessarily desert, but kind of a medium between the oak tree or cedar tree forests of the Texas hill country and the almost desert landscape of northern Mexico. Miles of wide open ranch land with loads of thorn and mesquite trees with some oak trees sprinkled in for good measure. Growing up, we'd go down and visit family members in that region and when the sun would go down, I always felt creeped out by the area. There are some creeks that make you swear you were in Louisiana swamps, with large trees hanging over the creek beds, covered in Spanish moss and giving the areas a very creepy vibe, especially at night. It's well known that there are now lots of wild child pequin plants along lots of the rivers and creeks in this area because when Santa Ana's army were making their way to San Antonio before the Battle of the Alamo, the soldiers had with them chile pequin peppers to make salsa and add spiciness to their foods when they would make camp, and naturally... Lots of the soldiers would drop excrement along the creeks and the seeds of the peppers would find their way into the soil and begin sprouting the pepper plants. Anyway, one of my father's uncles claims he saw a large winged humanoid bird with glowing eyes swoop down on he and one of his buddies while out at the lake known as Choke Canyon, fishing for catfish late into the night from the bank without a boat. The story goes that it was around 11 p.m. or so on a Friday night, and let's call my father's Uncle Robert and his buddy Chester. The two men had decided to go fishing for catfish and drink some beers and enjoy the start of the weekend with a nice relaxing nighttime fishing trip to the lake, which was about 30 miles from the town they lived. So Robert, having worked in construction and having worked that entire day, was feeling sleepy and decided to nap in the truck while Chester stayed on the lake bank, listening to the radio and watching their fishing rods that were casted out in the water. Uncle Robert climbs into the driver's seat of his truck and falls asleep. An hour or so go by and he's rudely awoken by Chester, who is screaming and pounding his fist on the passenger window of the truck, yelling like a madman for Robert to unlock the door to let him into the truck cabin. Jarred and caught completely off guard, Robert unlocks the door and asks Chester, who is out of breath and panicking, what the hell is going on? Chester, clearly panicked and freaking out, says to start the truck up and for them to get the hell out of there. He said that he was chilling in his folding chair and had just caught a small catfish and had thrown it back into the water and had sat back down in his folding chair when he heard, 
what sounded like a large bird flapping its wings behind him. He stood up and turned around, and there was a bird-like humanoid, kind of like a large crane-like bird with a human face and a beak-like mouth with glowing red eyes and a massive wingspan, something like 12, 15-foot wingspan. So he turns around to see this thing flapping just behind and above him and appeared to be readying to land right where Chester was sitting. These two were born and bred South Texas country boys, like my father, and had grown up in the brush country hunting birds, bobcats, alligators at that same lake, fishing and being common rural kids. So they had a lifetime of experiences with wildlife in that region and had never seen anything like it. Robert starts up the truck, and in the rearview mirror, illuminated in the red glow of the brake lights, Robert sees the large bird creature land behind the truck and begin walking. Around the truck, over to the passenger side, it was shaped like a man-sized crane, with thin, long legs that looked like it would stand at eye level with an average height man, and it was the creepiest thing he'd ever seen. That's when Robert knew that Chester wasn't screwing around, and he throws the truck into gear and peels out of there. They end up getting back Robert's place and Chester, and he both decide to spend the night together, shotguns in hand, until morning, which is when they decide what to do next. They ended up going back the following day, armed to the tooth, to retrieve their fishing poles, folding chairs, and other fishing gear, and found the footprints of the whatever it was that they saw still fresh and in the sand around their fishing spot. This happened in the 70s, so it was before smartphones with cameras. When my father told me this story, I pictured something like a tall shoe bill, but there's nothing like that in that part of the state. Maybe it just wanted to eat the fish that Chester had just caught. Following the incident, they would end up eventually going back to fish in the evenings, but they would be sure to take firearms for protection. I'm 20, 7 now, but when I was 17, just weeks from 18, I lived in a small town in Missouri called Pierce City. I had saved up a good four years' worth of paychecks and sold my TV to buy a used Suzuki 6. At 650 it was my dream bike. I went and bought it, and my father helped me get it to our home because I wasn't legally able to ride it for another few weeks. I remember when we got home, I put it in our barn and locked the barn because we didn't have a garage. I don't remember why I did it, though. It's a very small town, and we knew pretty much everyone and are hours away from the nearest neighbor. I fell asleep about 10 p.m. or 11 p.m. and woke up at 3 a.m. because I heard a large bang near the barn. I thought it was one of the horses that might have gotten spooked or something, so I went out to check. I always carry a buck 110 folding blade, and when I got to the barn, it was still locked. There are no windows besides one way at the top, but it's a good 15 feet high, and there wasn't a ladder. I unlocked the barn and walked in, and my new, used bike was on the floor. I heard a crunching or chewing noise, so instinctively I grabbed my knife. There was very little light, just enough to reflect the polished metal. I peeked into the pen, and I kid you not. There was something squatted over the horse that it had to have killed, as it was a healthy animal, and we took good care of it. I've seen wolves eat animals before, and it wasn't like that it looked like the thing off Lord of the Rings. The cave-dweller thing, but taller, and I know it was only a couple seconds, but it felt like minutes of me being frozen there. Whatever it was looked at me, I turned and sprinted back to the house screaming. I swear it chased me. It ran on all fours and screeched like worn brakes on a heavy vehicle. I must have awoken my dad as he met me at the door with his gun loaded, fired two shots in its direction and then shoved me inside and shut the door. It seemed scared of the shots and we later dialed the police, though they found nothing. If you guys live near there and have heard anything of it, please tell me. It still haunts me and I live nowhere near there now. This one happened to my great-grandparents on my father's mother's side. 
They lived on their small cattle and livestock ranch in Christine, Texas, for the later decades of their lives. Christine is a super small town where everyone knows everyone, and there's no need to lock your doors when you leave or when you go to bed. My great-grandparents were the warmest people you'd ever meet, always smiling, sharing humorous stories with friends and family. They'd take your coats or jackets when you'd enter their warm home, and before hanging them up on their coat rack, they'd sneak a $20 bill into your pocket for you to find later. They were the kind of older couple who were always poking harmless jokes at each other in front of company to entertain you. Super charming and loving and always smiling and loving the life they'd built for themselves. Visiting them was always a treat because I grew up in the city, and when we would visit on a weekend, my great-grandfather would take my younger brother and I around the ranch to see the animals and livestock, pet the horses, feed the goats, and throw rocks into the stock pond. When we'd return to their house from seeing the ranch, my great-grandmother would have our favorite, breakfast for dinner on the table, fresh hash browns, farm-raised bacon, and ham, homemade tortillas, mild and spicy salsas, and fried eggs, and coffee, always with coffee, even if it was dinner time, and we loved it. So this story takes place during the 1960s, not exactly sure on the year, but my great-grandparents were in their late 50s, and their children, my grandmother, were all grown and had gotten married and moved out, so at this point it was just the two of them living on the ranch. They were on their way home from visiting some family in the south side of San Antonio, about 70 miles away. They had lost track of time, so it was late into the evening when they left. So they're driving back home to their ranch near Christine, Tex, and on their route they have to drive over this wooden bridge that extends over a deep creek. I think sometime in the 1980s, a better road was paved into the town that no longer made it necessary to have to take this small dirt road and bridge from the highway 16 to their small ranch. Several years ago, the wooden bridge was torn down and a new bridge was built using steel and concrete. Spanish moss hangs from the trees, which really makes it creepy, and from what I remember, this bridge is about 80 feet long from end to end. Due to the creek, it expands over being relatively wide. Underneath the bridge is a good 30 to 40 foot drop down to the creek bed. For the most part, the creek is dry year-round and only sees water flow during rainstorms. As my great-grandparents are driving over this wooden bridge, their truck suddenly dies and comes to a stop near the middle of the bridge. My great-grandfather starts swearing up a storm because he's tired, it's late, and they're still about ten miles from home. He maintains his truck better than most, and they had a full tank of gas. Even the headlights and cabin lights shut off, so they were stuck there with only the moon bathing them and their surroundings in soft moonlight. My great-grandfather was born in the brush country of South Texas, so there's not much he hasn't seen out there, and in this situation, while most people might be a little intimidated to leave the safety of their vehicle, my great-grandfather was in his element, out at night, in what is essentially his backyard. Thinking it has to be a battery connection that came loose, my great-grandfather asks great-grandmother to hang tight, pops the hood and opens his door stepping out into the cool night to check under the hood and hope to diagnose the issue. As he's struggling to see, fumbling with the battery connections under the hood, behind him he hears the sound of clip-clops on the wooden bridge. It sounded like steps of a hoofed animal approaching him from behind. He turns around and lets his eyes adjust to the dim moonlight to see what's making the noise. Maybe it's a deer or a cow or a goat that's gotten loose from one of the other ranches in the area. Squinting, he's looking down the bridge and sees what appears to be a thin man, about five and a half feet tall, but with a set of very large ram horns on his head, walking upright, approaching him from the opposite end of the, the bridge. It's hoofed feet clip-clopping on the wooden bridge as it's steadily trotting towards him. A cold chill ran up my great-grandfather's spine, and he quickly shut the truck hood and hops back into the driver's seat, 
slamming shut the door behind him and locking it. My great-grandmother, confused by his sudden reactions, asks what's going on, and my great-grandfather points at the humanoid that is slowly approaching their vehicle. She sees it and reacts with what the hell is that? A goat watching it approach them in their vehicle. They can see that the horns on its head are very large, much larger than any ram or goat they've ever seen, but still cannot make out whether it has a ram or goat's head or a human's head. It's about 20 feet from the front of their truck when it hunches over and begins walking on all four of its cloven feet. They can only vaguely make out its features as it reaches their vehicle and begins circling them my great-grandparents twisting and turning in their seats to watch it as it bobbing its head up and down, pacing around their truck. It doesn't ever touch their truck. It only slowly saunters around their vehicle with the only sound in the night being its hooves clipping and clopping on the wooden bridge. Though it was dark and difficult to make out its exact features, they both agreed that it had the body of a skinny, bony man, but with the head of a goat, they both said that the creepiest part of the encounter was watching its large horns bobble around the front and rear of their truck, unsure if it was going to do anything to them and how it felt like an evil or demonic entity, that they could sense it not being a normal animal but a creature with evil intent. They hold their breath and don't know what to do, and my great-grandmother, being very Catholic, begins praying quietly under her breath. On its fifth or sixth time walking around their truck, it stands back up on its hind legs and meanders towards the opposite end of the bridge from which it came, eventually disappearing into the black night and leaving them in the truck, frightened and shaken. A moment later, like clockwork, power is restored to their vehicle, and my great-grandfather starts the truck up and peels out of there, making a beeline for their home where they rush into the house and grab firearms and spend the rest of the night locking all of the doors and windows and got no sleep that night. When we were younger, my cousins and I would go and visit what we believe is the same bridge. I'm not sure if this was the actual bridge where this apparently took place, but it was very similar, and we would park our truck, get out, and thrill ourselves by walking around out there after dark with flashlights and embrace the creepy ambience, armed with shotguns and rifles, of course. My great-grandparents never saw anything like that creature again, but from that night onward, my great-grandfather always kept a loaded shotgun and a pistol in his truck. I live in Hauptstuhl, Rhineland, Falls, Germany. This occurred on June 4th, 2017. I suffered a headache at around 11 p.m., so I decided to go to bed. I entered my bedroom and my head began to feel heavy and my eyes began to hurt with intense pain. I got into bed and almost instantly I fell asleep. What seemed like seconds later, I heard the TV and the PlayStation 4 turn on downstairs. Upon hearing this, I thought maybe my wife was home from work. I realized that couldn't be possible because she didn't get off until later that day, fully aware of what was going on, but obviously still tired. I tried to get out of bed, but found myself unable to move at the slightest. Sleep paralysis had been common for me throughout life, so at first I wasn't too worried, but this was different. I began to panic and try to force myself out of this paralysis, but every time I used energy I heard a voice inside of my head tell me to stop moving and sleep. I knew the voice wasn't my own because at the same time I was talking to myself in my head, almost yelling, saying, wake up now. This battle with the other voice which almost seemed to control me went on for about 15 minutes until I finally had enough. I said a quick prayer and promptly rolled over onto my back, trying to catch my breath when suddenly I saw it. Please be aware that the incident happened in a matter of seconds, so I am trying to describe it as best as possible. Directly in front of me on my windowsill was a small figure. If I had to estimate, it was maybe three feet tall. I did not see any eyes because the room was pitch black but the silhouette of the figure was clearly visible because of the light that showed through the blinds. I believe it had its back towards me, 
One hand was raised, and there was a bright blue, almost white light that was casting through the window onto it. A quick flash was emitted, and the being was gone. Almost instantly that the being had left that my headache, eye pain, and fatigue also left. This experience has truly changed my life. I have had other incidents in my life that now, that I look back on after doing more research, I believe, were other visitations and or abductions. I appreciate you taking the time to read this, and if anyone could offer me help or insight, I'd be very grateful. I've only told my mom and my now-deceased best friend from childhood about this small, puzzling, but very impactful event in my life. I say impactful just in the sense that I now think about this almost every day of my life since it happened. I'm 35 now. I was probably around nine years old when this happened. This happened in New England. I was in my room at night, and I was having trouble sleeping. I felt different. I had this weird energy that night that was keeping me up. Suddenly there was what appeared to be a woman, clear as day, with a beautiful reddish or pinkish dress on, red hair, standing in my dark room. I was startled at first. Because of the fright, she was smiling at me in the kindest, most loving way. I was still pretty blown away by this. At this point, I was just sort of mesmerized and shocked, laying in my bed still looking at her, and she's looking at me. Still Jay smiling. She's kind of glowing, but not in the same light we are used to anyways. She was just very, very visible in my dark room. I could see her clear as day. After laying in bed looking at her for a while longer, I got up, put my knees tucked in under my shirt, and sat on my bedroom floor like that and looked at each other some more. This went on for a while. She was in my room like this for probably... At least 20 minutes, probably closer, 40 minutes. After a while, I stopped being afraid and relaxed a bit and just vibed out with her for a while. I was still pretty shocked as this didn't seem to be stopping anytime soon and also, what? So after sitting on my floor vibing out with my new friend, I turned my back, went around the corner in the hall for a moment to see if she would disappear or something, but she didn't. She was still there, at least for now. Then I went to the bathroom and went pee. When I came back in my room, she was gone. I just laid back down in my bed, went to sleep after that thought about waking my parents. But she was gone at this point. I hoped she would come back the next night. She did not. I told my mom a couple of days later what happened. My mom was religious at the time and told me it was an angel after I told her what happened. I hesitate to define it. I don't know what to call what happened that night. I know this story sounds super cliché, like straight out of an episode of Touched by an Angel, remember, that show. Uh, anyways, hope you believe me, but really I just hope someone else has had a similar experience that I can relate to about it. So, who do you think she was? What happened? I'd like to know your opinions on this strange night, or if something like this has happened to anyone else, as there are not many places to voice this story. I would like to know about any of your similar experiences, too. A strange and chilling incident unfolded one Saturday night in Riverside, California, an event that would haunt my dreams for years to come. It all began when Charlie Wetzel, a 24-year-old resident of nearby Bloomington, experienced something so inexplicable that it defied rational explanation. The night was dark, the kind of darkness that envelops everything and makes the world seem a little more eerie. Charlie was driving on a quiet street near Riverside, minding his own business when the unimaginable occurred. He recounted the story to authorities with a sober and earnest tone, as if the memory still sent shivers down his spine. A monster jumped out at me, he began, his voice quivering with fear. I listened intently, my curiosity peaked. Charlie went on to describe the creature he had encountered, a being that defied all logic and reason. It had a round, scarecrowish head. 
He explained, his words painting a vivid and unsettling picture in my mind, like something out of Halloween. My heart raced as he continued to recount his terrifying ordeal. It wasn't human, he stressed, his eyes wide with fear. It had a longer arm than anything I'd ever seen. When it saw me in the car, it reached all the way back to the windshield and began clawing at me. I couldn't help but imagine the sheer horror that must have gripped him at that moment. My mind struggled to make sense of the nightmarish creature he described. It didn't have any ears, he added, his voice quivering. The face was all round. The eyes were shining like something fluorescent, and it had a protuberant mouth. It was scaly, like leaves. As he spoke, I could sense his terror, his disbelief that he had encountered something so utterly unnatural. The details of his encounter were etched into my mind, and I found myself hanging on every word. Charlie's fear escalated when the creature reached over the hood of his car and began clawing at the windshield. He knew he had to act fast, or whatever this nightmarish entity was might gain access to the vehicle. I held that pistol and stomped on the gas, he said, his voice trembling. The thing fell back from the car and it gurgled. The image of that monstrous being clawing at his windshield and making inhuman sounds was enough to send shivers down anyone's spine. The sheer audacity of it all left me in disbelief. Sheriff's officers arrived on the scene, and Charlie pointed out thin, sweeping marks on his windshield that he claimed were made by the creature. They ventured to the location of this bizarre encounter, but found nothing to either prove or disprove Charlie's harrowing tale. The scene itself was eerie, situated where North Main Street dipped and crossed the almost dry Santa Ana riverbed. It was as if this otherworldly event had occurred in a place where reality blurred with the unknown. Charlie recounted how he had initially hesitated to share his story, fearing that no one would believe him. But his wife had persuaded him to contact the authorities, convinced that something unnatural had occurred that fateful night. Sheriff Sergeant E.R. Holmes, in an attempt to offer a rational explanation, suggested that a large vulture might have landed on the hood of Charlie's car. Sometimes cars hit them when they're in the road eating rabbits cars have killed, he explained. He conducted his own search of the area on Sunday, but he too came up empty-handed. I didn't even find a feather, he concluded. Charlie's story remained etched in my memory, a chilling reminder that the world was full of mysteries and unexplained phenomena. What had he encountered that night on the dark streets of Riverside? The answers eluded us, leaving only questions and a lingering sense of dread. I was wondering if anyone else has also had any experiences with people that didn't quite seem to be people, like there was something off about them. I had an experience some time ago that I have never could shake off. So this happened in Charleston, see, around Xmas of 2017. I used to work at a popular coffee shop that was inside of a popular big box retail store. One day around Xmas time, I had two guests that struck me as odd immediately. They were pale Caucasian women, probably mid-twenties that both looked nearly identical, but one was about a head taller. They had the exact same haircut, very straight, platinum, blonde, bowl-like cuts. Their faces were quite round, and their eyes were a noticeably bright hazel color and appeared quite large, but not in like a disproportionate gray alien kind of way. They both also had a fairly odd stiff gait, as though they had a board strapped to their back. They sort of shuffled their feet around when they walked. They both also had on oversized sweaters, and I noticed later the shorter one had theirs on backwards. The weird part was their behavior. When they first walked in the shorter one looked around the store as if they've never been in one. Her overall demeanor was somewhat childlike. Like a good customer service rep, I welcomed them and told them to ask if they had any questions. The short girl looked to the taller as if for approval. She then slowly nodded her head towards me, mouth slightly agape, and then attempted a hand wave. 
Instead of waving at the wrist like most people, she waves with her forearm, palm flat and straight in a sort of robotic windshield wiper-like motion. She then turns to the taller one, who gives her an encouraging nod. They then proceeded to walk around the cafe, looking at the cups and merchandise. The short girl would often point all around the store and seem to be asking the taller one questions, almost as if this was a guided tour of sorts. Now, obviously, I'm no linguist, but my city is a fairly popular tourist destination, and I've met foreigners from all over the globe. Even if I don't recognize a specific language, I can usually estimate Randwood out where it may be from, whether it's Germanic, Slavic, Asiatic, Mid-Eastern, etc., in origin. But the language they spoke to each other was very strange and not like one I've ever heard. Imagine if you mixed Simlish with baby babble and sped it up. Lots of ga, blue and andu sound. They continued on checking out the merchandise and going on what seemed to be a kill in a session. They would often open up cups and look inside, grab bags of beans and squeeze and shake them. At one point, the shorter one took apart a French press and the taller one seemed to try to explain what it was for. This went on for about another ten minutes or so when the short one picked out a studded cup to purchase. She shuffles her way to the pose, puts the cup on the counter, frequently looking towards her friend as if looking for reassurance, who again does a simple nod in encouragement. She then looks towards me and attempts to smile, which was just baring her perfectly straight white top teeth as though she were biting her bottom lip and slowly nodding, not saying a word. It was here I noticed her sweater was on backwards, the tag sticking out in front of her neck. Now that I had a good look, I will say she was quite oddly attractive, but there was something that about her appearance that gave me uncanny valley vibes. But I couldn't tell you what exactly was off. I will say I don't recall them ever blinking. I scanned the cup and went on the typical checkout spiel to which there was no reply. When it was time to pay, she pulled out a silver credit card that had no markings whatsoever. No logos, no numbers, no name. Just blank plastic with a chip. She then looks back over to the taller one and says something, who then comes over and finishes the transaction for her, showing her as though it was a teaching moment. I hand her the cup and she once again slowly nods her head, mouth ajar, and does her windshield wiper wave. They then shuffle their way out the cafe into the rest of the store, and I never saw them again. I've told this story to people before, and they usually hand wave it and say they were probably just tourists from Europe, or maybe they had a condition of sorts. But like I've said, I've encountered many foreigners, and none of them acted this much like a fish out of water, nor was their overall demeanor and behavior this uncanny. I won't rule it out as a possibility, of course, but it just doesn't quite sit satisfactory for me. It was just too weird. I don't know what do you guys think. Have any of you experienced anything similar? Hey, all? I want to preface this saying I've always been more of a skeptic when it comes to paranormal. I considered myself one that leans more towards a grounded science view and one that wants to believe, but would need to experience it myself to actually believe. I'm also aware that sharing this in this sub is going to yield some amount of confirmation bias, since most here I would assume are going to lean towards believing, but maybe not. A bit of background. My dad's side of the family lives in a home that eventually became the place of death for my nana. She went into hospice when her health deteriorated enough and eventually passed peacefully in her home on the first floor living. Room in a hospice bed that was set up for her. Nothing weird ever happened after this to my knowledge. Fast forward to a few years back. My dad has inherited the home and has moved back from across the country with a cat and has since adopted a second cat. Over a few years, I was able to work towards mending things with him born of a complicated past. Just this summer, his health took a rapid turn and he became essentially bedridden and a fall risk, so we set up a bed for him downstairs in the same area that our Nana was in. 
Unfortunately, he passed just a few days ago, and I'm now grieving. He passed away, not in the home, but in the hospital. It's also important to say he was home literally the day before, and in one day we went to the, uh... And he passed away the following early a.m. I've been going over daily to start sorting through important paperwork and taking care of his cats. It was tough going into the house the first time, and I always give a hey, Dad. Greeting coming in, knowing I won't get a reply, but it's part of being open and vulnerable in my healing, and did it prior to his death. And no, this story doesn't lead to hearing a greeting back. The first night there, just the night prior to writing this and the encounter, was uneventful, but uh, I bawled my eyes out at the foot of his bed in pretty much every room in the house. Before I left, I laid in his bed downstairs and the cats jumped up to join me for snuggles. So this evening at 8 p.m., I went over and conducted some of my goals I had. When the goals were done, I did what I did the previous evening and laid down in his bed. His two loving kitties joined me and I was sending texts to my mom. This is when it happens. I'm laying there and suddenly this full body chill hits. I'm in a tank top and athletic shorts, but I run hot and I've always been very warm in the house, plus I'd been moving around a lot just prior to laying down. No reason to have chills. Anyways, I get the chills, literally covered in chill bumps head to toe, hair standing at attention every inch of my body. Hell, even my nipples were hard. Right at this moment, which happened within seconds, both of the cats reacted lightning fast and raised their heads and were looking like something startled them. Chills are one thing, but the reaction of two furry friends at the same exact time, this is what really sold it for me. All three of us laid there. I wasn't exactly scared, and I don't scare easy these days, but it had me shocked and rattled, unable to process what the hell is happening, so it's difficult to articulate the exact emotion I was experiencing. I started to communicate as if it was my dad telling him how much I love him and miss him. Then I realized maybe this is my nana. Then I pretty much just said whoever this is. The whole time I felt this full body feeling of something being there, and the cats were also still more or less focused on whatever thing had their collective attention. One cat eventually got up to walk to the water bowl area, and the other cat, I, I think, just relaxed, but I still had chills everywhere. After this, I got up feeling a bit uncomfortable with the realization that my world and possibly entire system of non-belief was shattered. I had chill bumps the entire time I brought items to my truck outside, getting ready to leave, and forgot something inside. I was half expecting to see something when I went back in and was on edge and moving a bit quicker. Said my goodbyes and departed, unable to explain or rationalize this. I shared this with my wife as soon as I got home, and my four-month-old was staring wide-eyed, looking captivated the whole time. It was cute. I also will be sharing this with my mom and sister tomorrow and had simply texted them, saying something happened. I can't explain and need to share. Any input, thoughts, questions, or comments are very welcome. Thanks for reading all of this. I'm not skeptical anymore and think it was either my nana or, wishfully, my dad's spirit coming back to his home. And as a reminder, nana passed away in the home. But dad passed away in the hospital. He spent a lot of time in this very bed, though. I went RV camping with a very large group a few years back. There were probably 45 of us, and the main campground was full of rice. When I and the two girls I was planning to share a trailer with pulled up, no problem, there were a few spots across the road near the river. So we were by ourselves, and the second night I was awakened by animals moving around outside our RV. One of them growled, and it sounded very much to me like a cougar. I don't own a gun, and I left my knife in the house, so we were defenseless. I woke up the girl sleeping closest to me, thinking that the other girl probably wouldn't handle the situation well. So my awake friend and I just prayed and sat there tense, ready to fight for our lives until the cougars eventually went on their way. It was a hellish night, and 
I didn't sleep at all after that. Turned out, the cougars were a couple of guys from the other campsite playing around making animal noises and mucking around our RV. We're all in our thirties, by the way. I'm not mad, but I'll never go camping again. I saw something on Monday night that still has me totally shaken to my very core. I have always loved nature. I love the woods. I love hiking and camping, fishing. I'm really into mycology, so I'm out looking for mushrooms and various types of fungus whenever I get a chance. The weather was absolutely beautiful on Monday for this time of year, so towards evening time I decided to round up some of my Wally gear and head down to an old train trestle crossing the Mahoning River in Niles, Ohio. I'd parked my car about a mile and a half from the trestle so I could walk the tracks and hit a few other spots along the river on my way down there. By the time I reached the trestle, it was pretty much dark. I was wearing a headlamp at the time, so I had a depending light source. At this location, there is a lake directly across the river, which the two are connected by a small overhead dam. I was there for 15 minutes when all of a sudden this overwhelming feeling of dread came over me. I switched my headlamp on to turn around to start back up the river bank and right behind a big sycamore tree. I saw what looked to be a very large animal kind of kneeling beside or behind it. As I locked my eyes on it, I completely froze. I knew I was definitely seeing something there, but my mind couldn't process it. What I was looking at didn't make any sense. The thing that I kept saying to myself was, animals aren't supposed to look like that. Right as I'm thinking this, it's as if this thing read my mind stood up and made itself perfectly visible in the most pretentious way. It almost had this vibe like, yeah, now you see me. You know I'm real. I definitely exist. What are you going to do about it? And as soon as it happened, it kind of hunched over and made its way into the brush. I was out of there like a flash. As soon as my feet hit the tracks, I ran and ran the entire way back to my car without stopping. By the time I reached my car, I couldn't breathe. Both my legs were locked up. I was vomiting, and somewhere in between the encounter and running away, I had pissed myself. It's early Friday morning now, and I think I've only slept for about six or seven hours altogether. I've been constantly searching YouTube and all kinds of stuff listening to eyewitness accounts, and it sounds like these things are encountered quite often. I've heard of the dogman before, but never really took it seriously. Before the night of this encounter, I would always picture a dogman to look like some little, skittish, coyote-looking creature. Man, I love the woods, and I love nature. The woods, for me, was always a safe haven I could venture into to escape stress. Stress at work, bills, relationship problems. I could always take a nice long hike, go fishing or foraging, and come home feeling 75% better. Now I feel like I was threatened and kicked out if my second home. The only thing I can keep thinking is, these things aren't supposed to exist. I feel like a terrified little kid who just came face to face with a dreaded monster in the closet. You know... The monster your parents told you, no weight assured you, wasn't real and couldn't hurt you. People need to be made aware of these things. They are as real as it gets, and they are dangerous. Thinking back to what this thing looked like and how it was built, these things are perfectly adapted killing machines. The way the arms and legs looked, it looked like it was perfectly adapted to walk on all fours as well as on two legs. It was so quiet and fluent with its movements also. It's not like in the movies where the monster comes charging out of the woods, growling and snarling. These things are R, masters of camouflage, and they utilize the darkness perfectly. I didn't notice the smell from it, probably because the wind was on my back at the time, but it sure smelled me. Its nose was up in the air the whole time of our encounter, just sniffing away. This experience has torn a huge hole in me. Every time I eat, I get nauseous. I can't sleep for more than 20 minutes at a time, and every time I close my eyes, that thing is all I can see. 
I'm trying not to dwell in the fear. I'm trying to accept what I saw and what had happened. But it's hard. I'm really glad I found this group and found a few things on YouTube, so I know I'm not alone. My story happened in the late 1970s. I and a couple friends went to a church sports camp for a week at Jumonville, Pennsylvania, currently known as the Jumonville Camp and Retreat Center, Lawn, and it's about an hour and 20 minutes southeast of Pittsburgh. It's located on the Chestnut Ridge where numerous unexplained phenomenon has been reported from Sasquatch UFOs, Dogmen, and Thunderbirds. It also sits in the Appalachian Mountain. Each cabin had about seven boys. The mess hall was at the bottom of the hill along an asphalt path. Different cabins would line up outside to follow one another down the path. When we went to eat one morning, we were all walking to breakfast. Up ahead of me, I noticed kids walking off the path and into the grass. When I got up to that spot, I looked down and couldn't believe my eyes. Laying on the path was what looked like a stillborn monkey fetus. It was big, too, at least two feet long. It was as tall as the path was wide. It was definitely bipedal, but didn't have a tail. I was just staring at this thing, which is probably only 30 seconds when I noticed I had fallen behind my group and was getting passed by other groups. So I ran to catch my group. My friend K.N. was with me at camp that year. He said he was right next to me and remembers seeing the fetus, too. So, I am 19 female, and this happened to me when I was about four or five years old. I was with my older brother, who was about 11 or 12 at the time. Most of the people in my life, like friends or family, pretty much know Ab this story as well. I think about this event a lot, probably every day. This event has for sure left me very paranoid as per around the woods. Yet, I'm still pretty curious about it at the same time. Anyways, one morning my brother and I were heading to the car for school. It was still a bit dark outside, but you could see the sun coming up. I remember the sky having a sort of greenish tint. We typically don't use the front door ever and usually just use the side door to the house. We have one large storm door and then your typical glass door on the outside of it as we are heading to go outside, I reach for the handle, and my brother stops me mid-reach and pulls me away from the door. He can see outside as the door is glass. At the time, my house was also completely surrounded by woods. You cannot see it from the street either. My brother points to what he sees, and as I remember, it was incredibly tall. I was, of course, very small at the time, so you'd think, oh, maybe it just appeared larger to us because we were kids. But I swear this shit was like seven foot tall. This thing looked almost solid white or gray, and it had what looked like three dark circles or holes going down its body. We knew this thing was abnormally tall because of how slow and big its strides were. It almost looked like slow motion in a way. It was also just body and two legs. That's all it looked like. I'm not even sure if there was a face or a head. It was walking at the edge of our woods and it seemed to be heading to the backyard, sort of minding its own business egg. I don't have any memory of what happened after, but my mom has always said that right after it happened. We ran to her and my dad crying and panicked. She said she separated us and asked us separately what happened. We both described the same thing and told the same story. My mom said it freaked her out pretty bad as well. I remember my brother and I tried to guess what we saw and all we could think was that maybe it was a dying animal walking because it could have been bone that we saw. But I remember it wasn't limping or dragging any skin or anything. It was walking perfectly straight and upright. A few years after, we started hearing this horrible screaming at night. I know there's foxes, owls, and all that other stuff that screams low, but this thing would run around the house, like circle around the house in the middle of the night, on and on. I would hear it in my sleep, and it would make me have horrible nightmares of my family being eaten, 
This happened for a short period of time. My dad had finally had enough, and he got a permit to shoot and take out whatever it was. As soon as he got the permit, it quit. Never heard that thing again, and we have lived here for 13 years. I'm not sure if it's related, but I struggled with terrible sleep paralysis for a few years, and it was only at this house. I would wake up, unable to move, and would have a man or woman screaming into my ear. I would finally be able to move and instantly cry because of fear and actual pain in my ear. I would also sometimes be paralyzed and then feel my body going up. My body wasn't going up, but I was. Whenever this would happen, I would be fully conscious and aware. I could hear myself in my head, and I just kept saying, put me down. Put me down, I'm not going up. And I would slowly go back down, but it would always take so long it felt like. This used to scare me to the point that I was afraid to even fall asleep. Eventually, I talked to a few different mediums, and they gave advice that helped. Anyways, I could go way more into that topic, but that's not what this post is about. I have a few true experiences with the supernatural or spiritual, and I will prob post them on here as well. Overall, I'm hoping someone could give some useful insight on this situation. Maybe it isn't what I think it is, and someone else has a better answer. My heart rate has been going bonkers while typing this. One particular encounter from the past still haunts me to this day. A story that defies explanation and continues to send shivers down my spine. It all began during a United Steelworkers representative training retreat in October 1992, a seemingly ordinary event that would forever change the way I looked at the world. I was attending the retreat with a friend, both of us eager to soak in the knowledge and camaraderie that such events often provided. We had chosen to take a hike to the Jumonville Cross one crisp autumn afternoon. The beauty of the Pennsylvania landscape surrounded us as we made our way up the mountain, but as we neared the top, an eerie feeling began to wash over us. It was a sense of dread, an overwhelming emotion that left us both unsettled. We hesitated but pressed on, determined to reach our destination. However, the closer we came to the cross, the more the dread intensified. It was as though an invisible force was pulling us away, urging us to leave that place. We didn't stay long. In fact, we decided to make our way back to our vehicle as quickly as possible. This strange encounter was puzzling, because neither of us had ever experienced such a feeling before. We couldn't shake the sense that something otherworldly had caused this reaction. And as I would later discover, my friend's life took a dark turn after that day as if the encounter had cursed him in some way. He withdrew from society, living like a hermit in the remote corners of rural West Virginia. Years passed, and I had all but forgotten that unsettling hike until one morning when curiosity led me back to Jumonville Cross. I was with my girlfriend, and our plan was simple. Hike up the mountain, enjoy some donuts and coffee, and bask in the serenity of the landscape. We found a peaceful spot on the grass near a podium that stood near the cross structure. We chatted, sipped our coffee, and took in the breathtaking view. At that moment, we believed we were alone, undisturbed by any other visitors. But then, something inexplicable happened. Out of nowhere, we noticed what appeared to be a light puff of smoke swirling around the podium. It was as if a wisp of fog had materialized out of thin air. Suddenly, an elderly man and woman stood there together, seemingly emerging from the ethereal mist. At first, we brushed it off, assuming that the couple had been there all along. We exchanged polite greetings, saying hi to the elderly pair, but strangely, they offered no response. The couple remained utterly still, their gaze fixed upon the distant horizon. I couldn't help but notice something odd about them. Their eyes, both of them, were solid black an eerie and unnatural sight that sent a shiver down my spine. It was a sight that defied explanation. 
As we continued to observe them in stunned silence, the elderly couple eventually began to move. They glided away from the podium and simply faded from sight, as though they were never there to begin with. It was a bizarre experience, for they had appeared so solid and lifelike that it left us questioning whether we had encountered ghosts or something else entirely. I couldn't shake the memory of those black eyes, and after the encounter, my friend and I discussed the phenomenon known as the black-eyed people, which he had recently heard about. We also delved into my girlfriend's reaction, which had been much less abrupt than mine. She had experienced emotional changes during unexplained incidents in the past, leading me to believe she might be an empath, a beacon of some kind. Her presence at the Jumonville Cross may have inadvertently triggered the appearance of the elderly couple's strange energy. Our encounter was not an isolated incident. Over the years, the Jumonville Cross has been the backdrop for countless unexplained events, including an increase in Bigfoot sightings and other bizarre anomalies. The area with its Christian campground and retreat has always had an air of mystery about it. Moreover, it's near the very place where a young military officer named George Washington and his soldiers ambushed French troops in 1754, igniting the spark that would eventually lead to the French and Indian War. Reports of musket fire, disembodied voices, and the lingering smell of gunpowder in the nearby glens and hollows only added to the mystique. The Jimminville Cross remains a place of both beauty and inexplicable phenomena, a spot where the boundaries between the known and the unknown blur. As for my friend, he continues to live in seclusion, forever haunted by the encounter that changed his life, and I am left with a lingering question. What exactly did we witness that fateful day on the mountain? I live in a very rural farming area of Kansas. This happened in the fall of 2007. I went for a night drive with a friend on some country roads amid cornfields. Where I live, corn stalks grow tall on both sides of the road in many places. It is a very desolate and dark area at night. No one around for miles and you could see the Milky Way in all her glory because there are no lights. As I was driving, we saw something resembling the cartoon character Gumby run across the dirt road, lit up by our headlights. It crossed probably ten feet in front of us. The creature was dark maroon in color and with bulbous hands and feet, no digits. It walked on two legs. It had very smooth-looking skin, almost like a shark or dolphin. It didn't stop to look at us, and I never felt threatened. The creature ran like it was afraid from one cornfield, across the road to another. We didn't witness any more strange sightings that night or have any weird experiences after. Have you ever seen a maroon creature like I did? My parents are from a small pueblo in the Sierra Madre Mountains in Oaxaca, Mexico. Over there, it's very rural and secluded and surrounded by bosques, forests. To get a sense of what I'm talking about, Google, San Pedro, Ulox, and you'll see what I mean. Growing up, my parents would always tell me stories of supernatural occurrences they or their family would encounter. Over there, people accept this as fact, not fiction. It's not unusual to hear voices calling your name at odd hours of the night hear dogs scrimmage outside and cry in fear, or hear weird tappings or knockings outside your door. The locals warn of staying out at night for too long, venturing too far out into the wilderness or visiting rivers alone. As a young boy, my father would accompany his dad to El Rancho, the ranch which was far away from town. One day, as he was playing outside in the fields, he saw a tiny figure a few meters away from his. This figure had elven, like ears, and looked like a small child. It was beckoning my dad to follow him. My dad had heard of these beings before. Parents warned their children of these beings, and so ran to his dad. 
My grandfather immediately believed him and grabbed his rifle, asking my dad where he saw it. My dad pointed in the direction where he saw it, and my grandfather ran out and loaded his rifle, threatening the being not to come closer or harm my dad. After hearing very similar stories of these beings from relatives and my parents, I wholeheartedly believe they're telling the truth. There's something out there, and I hope that one day we open our hearts and minds to learning more. For clarification, I saw it in El Paso, Texas, and the women who was investigating it was somewhere in the Midwest. Allow me to explain the situation. Two or three years ago, I was on Reddit using a different account, and I was bored. I happened upon a post that intrigued me greatly. It was of a young woman who was investigating a tunnel that was said to be haunted. She had investigated this with her friend and found strange sigils across the area, and even dreamed some up. I decided to join the mystery and assist them, but misfortune was clearly on their side. I got her Instagram, and she would send me pictures of what she would find, various darkish anomalies in the background of the area, and a photo her friend took of a ghost which had began stalking her, the friend, ever since she started helping her. The being was completely black and abnormally tall, and his face was like a pale moon. All I knew at that point was that this could be something like an ARG. It wouldn't be long after that I encountered the same being. I was walking around in my house when it manifested out of a closet and stared at me. I felt it, so I turned around and stared back, and it floated back into the closet. I was too scared to check, so I just stood there, and I immediately backed out of any further investigation and left it at that. As of then, I've not had any encounters with it. The whole thing still creeps me out to this day, and I've been searching for answers ever since I've gotten the opportunity to do so. For those wondering as to why I waited so long to make a post and tell the story, let it be known that I didn't want this thing going after me. It intimidated me, and I admit that. I was only 14 when it happened, and I was scared of the consequences. And in the further years, stuff started happening that required more of my attention, which eventually led me to assume that this was just something I'd have to take to my grave. All I ask is for closure. What did I really see that day? A bit taller than a Barbie doll creature that looks human, and though they may be wild, they are well-dressed, akin to the styles of the 17 or 1800s. Several years ago, I clearly watched a well-dressed young man slide down a bit of old house siding at the back of my yard, trying to escape my attention, and he left a skid mark in the dirt that my intelligent husband couldn't explain away as a mouse or a chipmunk because they were bipedal shoe. Mark's footprints also left behind, and though my husband was a firm skeptic, he later had his own clear sighting of a well-dressed little man that was older and looked to my sighting. I, we, don't know what to call these people, but I'd like to find a specific forum in which to discuss them. Currently, I concern about the hard heat wave we are about to experience. I added water sources in the yard or garden tonight and tried to express the situation aloud to them. I can only hope my little neighbors benefit from my efforts, but I would like to discuss such things with others who know about them and care to share our world. I seem to be able to assume this forum is a place to post real observations and concerns with trust. Where do I go? Where do we turn because we know these folks are here without a doubt? We want to be good neighbors and would like to connect with others who make such efforts to learn what they like, need, want, dislike, etc. This is in North Central Indiana, USA. Sightings are infrequent but ongoing. My husband swears he recently sighted two little men while backing out the car, but when he turned to look directly, there were only two robins. He's also seen them shift into squirrels. He's not teasing me or joking. He 100% believes what he'd seen as, and I, with my own sightings.
This happened in about 1990 in southeast Michigan. Twice I saw a tall, black humanoid-shaped figure that ran like the wind and appeared to almost fly across the ground. Both times it was dark out, and both times it scared the hell out of me and the friend I was with. I was with two different friends, one at the first sighting and the other at the second. They both saw it, too. Back up about four years before I saw this creature, a friend of mine was killed riding a minibike. My brother and I were getting cryptic phone calls from someone our age who wouldn't tell us his name. I can't remember what he'd talk about, but it was really creepy. One day I hung the phone up and my brother asked who it was. I told him he wouldn't say. My brother guessed it was the kid that died. Then in 2002, I go see the movie and man did it give me chills. Nothing bad ever happened to me. My friends are the town, but besides that, we experienced the same thing as West Virginia did in the movie. Anyone else experienced this before? I've lived in the same Midwest or Great Lakes state my whole life. This story is actually my earliest memory, and I'm looking for some insight. Sorry for the length, also unsure if this is right flair, since I've never posted on Reddit, just scrolling. I was very, very young, too. Three years old. One day, my mom was baking a cake. I ran into the kitchen to see the cake being pulled from the oven. I'm not sure if it's relevant, but in my memory of this, I'm basically astral projecting. Like I saw myself run into the kitchen. When I reached the oven, I zoomed back into my body and, being an excited toddler, put my hands in the hot oven. After crying and sitting the couch with my hands in a bowl of water, I calmed down and start walking down the hallway to my parents' room. The lights are off in the room, and as I'm walking, I see something peeking from behind the door. It looked almost like a really messed up version of Dobby from Harry Potter, with huge pointy ears and massive eyes, and it was stark white, almost glowing. I was a little scared, but for some reason I said hello to it. It hissed at me and I ran away. Now I would have ignored all of this if I hadn't had recurring dreams about it for the next decade. A few times a year, I would have this dream, and the details would change, but I always knew it was going to be this dream, because I had this horrible feeling of dread every time, but I couldn't wake up. The goblin would disguise itself at either one of my cats or a stuffed animal, and then suddenly transform and strangle me. I would wake up feeling like something had really choked me in real life. The dream stopped after I was 12, 13. I'm not sure why. I have other normal memories of that house, all that my parents have confirmed, even what show I was watching that day. When I told my mom about all this years later, she dismissed it as my twisted memory of one of our cats. But neither of the cats ever hissed at me without reason, and they were very sweet cats. I am twenty, one now, and still don't know what to think. This happened in the Sierra Nevadas in Yosemite Valley, California. It was a place that I'd been looking forward to hiking for a long time. I had prepared all my gear the previous night, double-checking everything. Water, food, tent, map, everything. I was just itching to get out there and explore. The sun's peeking up over the horizon and it's just so serene. Anyway, a few hours into the hike, I stop to refuel, taking a bit of a breather. I find a nook near a stream. I'm settling down to eat, and I hear this sound. First, I think it's probably a squirrel or something. But then the sound gets louder and heavier. Suddenly, I'm on alert. I'm no stranger to wildlife, and I instantly knew that this was different. I can just feel it in my gut. So I decided to move towards it and check it out. I tread lightly trying to figure out the source of the sound, and then I see this creature. It's not a bear, not a mountain lion, not anything that you would expect to see in the mountains. It was something different. This creature stood on its hind legs like a human but was much taller. The body was covered in these scales like a lizard, but these were larger, almost like armor plating. There was also a dark green color, 
almost black in some places, and its limbs were muscular but lean, like a runner's but way more powerful. The head was the most striking part. It had these slanted, almond-shaped eyes that glowed an eerie yellow. It didn't have a snout, more like a flat face. There were these slits where a nose should be, and the mouth was filled with sharp, jagged teeth, but not like predators' teeth, more like rows of serrated knives, if that makes sense. I didn't see any wings or anything, but it had a long tail, almost as long as the body, like a kangaroo's tail. It had four fingers, but they were long and ended in these sharp, curved claws. The thing I remember the most was that the creature moved so smoothly, like water flowing over rocks, almost graceful. You're probably thinking I'm pulling your leg or messing with you, but I swear this is exactly what I saw, this reptilian. Like creature was some next, level out of this world kind of being. I had a good five minutes or so to just stare at the thing. It's standing there at the edge of the clearing, just observing me like it's trying to figure me out. It didn't seem hostile. I mean, it was freaky as hell. I didn't want to provoke it, but instead of coming at me, it just kind of mirrored me as I moved. It was like we were doing some weird kind of dance. I know it sounds nuts, but it was as if the creature was just as curious about me as I was about it. We stood there for what felt like hours but I'm sure it was just a few minutes. At one point, I could swear it made a sound like a low hum or something. I couldn't make much of it, but it didn't seem threatening. Then suddenly it turned and disappeared. I was in shock. I mean, what did I just witness? So now at this point, there I was alone in the clearing with my heart pounding like a drum. I'm just standing there wondering if this really just happened. I was trying to process everything. I decided to follow in the direction where the creature went. I couldn't just let it go, and I had to know more. As I moved closer to where it disappeared, I noticed these huge tracks on the ground. It was not anything I had ever seen in any guidebook. The air felt different, too, almost electric. It felt charged, and there was this energy around that I just can't explain. I pushed through the undergrowth following the tracks. It felt like I was in some kind of a dream or a movie, like at any moment I would just wake up back in my tent and it would all be over. But no, this was real and it was actually happening. I walked further into the woods. I noticed that the tracks became harder to find. Then they started to disappear. It was like the creature had just vanished into thin air. I must have looked around for an hour or more, but there was no other sign of it. It was gone. But I swear to you that every time I closed my eyes that night, I could see those eyes. Its form was burned into my memory. I still can't believe what I saw that day. I had an absolutely bizarre experience at a Texans football game, and I just need to share it with you all to see if anyone else has ever encountered anything like this. Last fall, I was at NRG Stadium in Houston, Texas, when nature called and I headed to the bathroom. Now, here's where it gets weird. I'm at the urinal, and out of the corner of my eye, I spot this guy in a hoodie. But that's not the freaky part. He had this seriously strange nose that was kind of flaring if he was chewing on his own finger. The guy looked just like a rat. I was so creeped out that I could barely move. He had this intense gaze locked on me, and then he put his finger up to his lips, like he was telling me to be quiet and walked away. In that moment, I felt the most genuine fear I've ever felt, like the kind that sticks with you. No one else was in the bathroom. Has anyone else ever encountered something like this at NRG Stadium? Maybe not exactly at a football game, but just seeing someone or something that made you question reality. It's been bothering me ever since it happened, and I'm hoping I'm not alone in this. Looking forward to hearing your thoughts, and seriously, if anyone else has had a similar experience, please let me know I'm not going crazy here. Mm -hmm. 
In June of this year, I went camping for a night with four friends in Bald Eagle State Park in Center County, Pennsylvania. We had reserved a site that was somewhat remote, not near any of the other campsites. After we got there early, we hiked up to the site, set up camp, and then hiked around the area. Later, we made a fire, cooked dinner, and turned in not long afterward. At around 2 a.m., one of my friends and I couldn't sleep, so we trekked up to the main road. When we got to the road, we stood near the entrance to our site. As we stood there, a black pickup truck with its lights off appeared out of the woods and passed us very slowly. It was unmarked, but not a ranger. After 45 minutes or so, we decided to head back to bed. One of the girls went off into the woods to take care of some things while I climbed back into the tent I shared with her and got into my bag. After a couple of minutes, I heard her moving through the leaves towards the tent coming from my right. At the same time, I also heard the unmistakable rumble of tires on the ground. I stood up and looked out of the little screen window on the tent. It was a perfectly clear night with a very bright moon so I could see everything. I saw my friend come sprinting back to the tent and duck behind it just as the black truck pulled into our campsite, still with its headlights off, and then shut off its engine and sat there. The truck was parked about 50 feet from my tent, but I couldn't see a driver or how many people were in there. I just watched it. My friend had ducked down behind our tent, and I could hear by her breathing that she was terrified, but neither of us said a word. We just kept waiting for something to happen. Eventually, after 10, 15 minutes, the truck started up again and then backed up down the narrow dirt road. It never turned its headlights on. I heard it drive back in the direction it had originally come from. My friend burst into the tent at a second later. She was freaked out and wondered who was in the truck. After a frantic conversation, we went laid down, but we couldn't relax enough to fall asleep. In the morning, we all packed up and headed out as we had planned. We checked with the park, and they do not own any black unmarked trucks, nor did any ranger come to check on our site during the night. The reason I'm writing to you about this is that I know that you have received several Bigfoot reports from Bald Eagle State Park. I was just wondering if you had heard or read of other strange human activity at the location. My other two friends, strangely, never noticed or heard the truck. The entire incident didn't seem right, and it has bothered me since. So little background, it's 2012, I just graduated high school, and my brother moved from Florida to Maryland. To maintain foreclosures in the Maryland and D.C. area, I spent my two summers between college to work for him, giving him a little break, running his crew around moving, changing locks, cleaning the house, and taking pictures, etc. Our route sent us around D.C., and he often would put together the morning of early and then browse Daily Mail and other articles. He somehow stumbled across an article about how the movie Exorcist was inspired by this property in D.C. on Bunker Hill Road which we just so happened to maintain one of the neighbor's properties. That day it was my brother and myself, and we decided we would stop by where the old three-story house once stood. To be honest, I hadn't known what was there. I knew of the movie The Exorcist, but never been into scary movies, so didn't really know much about it. Well, the house where the 14-year-old boy lived in 1949, where The Exorcist was performed, is no longer there. Today it's a normal-looking historic street with older homes and this vacant lot with some trees and nice grass. It's now a park and even has signs about no entry between dusk to dawn. On the property where the house sat is a pavilion for the public shaped and an octagon, if I remember, maybe raised three feet from the ground, with a wraparound ramp. Around the ramp were bushes that circle the pavilion so we decided to walk up there. It was quiet and nothing seemed eerie or strange as we walked up the ramp. This is where it gets odd. We walk up the ramp and to the center of the pavilion, and not until we actually are in the pavilion, nearly dead center, we hear buzzing. 
Not just like a little fly or a bee flying by, but hundreds of insects, which we assume were flies, began to buzz all in unison from around the entire pavilion. It was very loud and noticeable swarm in the bushes. They didn't fly around either. We just stood there and looked around then at each other and were shocked and we did not stay. And bugs are totally normal, but I don't get why they didn't make a sound as we walked up the ramp or around the pavilion as we were so close to the bushes then. Hell, I maintained several properties and never experienced anything like that in Mother Nature, or anywhere for that matter. Those summers I experienced ground bees, to spiders, to voodoo in basements, books on spells and witchcraft, glass orbs or crystal balls, trap houses, Hell, we even explored the haunted, abandoned, insane asylum up there. But that moment still freaks me out. I have experienced something unexplainable in my past, and now have found the place to dump this story and possibly get inside or answers or opinions. I've never been the type that believed in ghosts entities, the paranormal, etc., until some very peculiar things started happening in the house I lived in with my mother and twin sister in 2020. One, it started in my twin's room. Random objects in a room would be turned 180 deg facing the wall. This was the pattern. From what I can remember, it was two objects that kept getting tampered with. A mannequin bust without a head. My sister got from an antique store that was set on a pedestal in a mirror. I don't remember where she got, that she had up against the wall on the ground, which was pretty heavy. These two objects would be turned while we would be gone out of the house. This happened a couple of times. I don't remember being scared. I found it really intriguing or exciting low. I remember, though, we, my twin mother and I informed my grandfather, who lived about five minutes away of the situation, and we scouted the house for signs of a squatter or anything else that could explain. Nothing. No signs whatsoever. Nothing abnormal. Fast forward a couple months. As time passes, we noticed my sister's belongings being turned more frequently. It started off maybe once a month, then a couple times a week. I remember we got so used to it that one time, when it happened again in my sister's room, I laughed it off, then trailed to my room. That's when everything changed. I was terrified. My belongings were now turned. It was a completely different feeling. It felt personal, invasive, and not the least bit funny anymore, to say the least. I remember an antique doll my grandmother gave me that I had propped up against the wall for back support on my bedside table, was now facing the wall, and I, Unop, was now sitting up 90 angle with no back support. I was so shaken, I forgot to take a photo. I kicked myself for that every day. Also, I had a small plushie sitting in her lap that was moved to the inside of my closet on the opposite wall. The scariest part was this plushie context avocado plushy with a face, was facing towards the opening of the closet. So when I got done setting my doll back up and turned around, this plushy was staring right at me. That was when I lost my cool, ran downstairs and broke down in fear, curled up with my sister. My mother was asleep during this time, so my sister and I comforted each other. To end this story, we had our witchy friend come over the next day and sage the house. It never happened again. I'm now living in a different state and still have my doll and avocado plushy. I know this was a long read and I'm a horrible storyteller. So a big thank you to whomever reads it all. I just really want to find an explanation for the pattern that occurred before I leave this earth. I'm happy to answer any questions. This was my best attempt at summing this all up. So first I'll start with what just happened. I was in the kitchen warming up leftovers and while putting ketchup on it I heard my daughter in the dining room. I heard her voice say something, but I couldn't hear her, which is normal. She talks softly. I'm the mornings. But here's the thing. 
My daughter is asleep in his wheelchair bound at the moment, so there is no way that she could have come in, said something, and run off without me noticing. I'm starting to freak out at this point. Background info. We moved in summer 22. Since moving in my daughter, same one, I have three. Has heard voices, seen shadows, heard breathing, once had her hair tugged lightly, and at night whatever is here used to mess with stuff in her room, till she started yelling at them and they leave her alone at night. I've heard voices, ex-kids at school. I was on the couch. I heard my middle daughter say, Mama, there are times it's a male voice, and these voices usually aren't really loud except the time I heard Mama. I've heard banging on the walls, but not in a threatening way. I've seen shadows and even some figures look like they're wearing a white shirt like my boyfriend always does. I've watched them walk into my room midday out the corner of my eye and at night while laying in bed. Sometimes I hear movement on my desk, but I know it's not the cats cause my desk is too cluttered and would completely crash if it were cats. I have an Xbox One in the living room for the kids to use. And my daughter has one in her room and a lot of nights. They turn on by themselves. We thought it was cats, but she watched it happen late one night. No cats around. I thought it was maybe a little power surge, but nothing else in the same surge protector reacts. A few months back, we were having problems without power, going out for just a few seconds, and I asked neighbors, but they did not experience anything. This house was built in the 90s, so it isn't super old. My daughter and I practice magic, mostly cleansing and healing. She practices more often than I do, but I know she is not doing anything bad because I've talked to her and taught her that bad magic will only bring bad things to her. She has protection runes placed in her room, and that has helped calm activity in there for the most part. I apologize for rambling, but I'm really starting to worry and I need advice. If anyone could help, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so I'll start with a short story of something that happened to me when I was five. Not sure if it is connected, but it did happen around the same time. I was playing with a ball out on the street footpath with my cousins, bouncing the ball with my five-year-old coordination. It skimmed my shoe and bounced onto the street. Without a thought, I chased the ball, followed by the screaming screech of tires. I closed my eyes and just held onto the ball like my life depended on it. The car had managed to stop, only an arm's reach in front of me. My cousins and I bolted, not looking back, knowing we'd get in trouble if we stuck around. Later that week, I went to the mall with my mom and dad. My mom was clothes shopping, which was killing me with boredom, so I was looking for something to do to keep my five-year-old brain occupied. This was the 1990s, so anything really, as these were simple times without the electric devices we have today. I went over to the escalator to pull on the rubber handrail, pretending like I had super strength and it was all me bringing people down the mechanical stairs. I was having the time of my life. Groaning and straining as with all my playful effort, helping people get from the first floor to the ground floor, until I got an overwhelming feeling something wasn't right, and what wasn't right was behind me. I turned my head while still holding onto the rail. A man in his late forties, early fifties, dressed in black hand, his hand reaching out to me like he was going to grab me, but as we locked eyes, he stopped and paused. Then Smile turned his hand into pistol shape and made a shooting gun gesture. I freaked out, looked for my parents, then looked back, and he was gone. I then ran over to tell my parents. But as I was safe and there didn't seem to be any real danger around, my mom just told me off and simply said that's enough mucking around and to stay by her side. Here's the strange part. Ten years later, I'm now 15, and again I'm in the mall with just my mom this time. Shopping for shoes this time. I get the exact same feeling out of nowhere. I look back and there he is, and he is not aged a day, same guy except this time I'm taller than him. He did the exact same thing as when I was five, 
I turned to lock eyes with him just before he was able to grab my shoulder. He then turns his hands into a pistol and fires. I didn't really react as immediately I got the flashbacks of when I was a child and sort of froze. I looked at my mom, who was still checking out shoes, and then looked back, and he was gone. Now, another thing worth mentioning, but once again, the I'm not sure it's connected, is that I almost died earlier that year by choking on some lamb that I inhaled while laughing at something I saw on the TV. Haha, <laughs> so I'm loosely saying I think this guy dressed in black was death, saying I almost got you, and eventually I will hence the shooting gun gesture. Or this is a guy who ages really well and is trolling me in one of the longest played out gags in history. Would love to see your thoughts, guys, or if anyone else has experienced something similar. Location, Pina Blanca, Puerto Rico, date, early July 1989 time, 1800. A local angler, Orlando Katake, was returning from fishing in the beach area when he noticed a group of bright white points of light hovering and turning just above the ground nearby. The man chased the lights and suddenly lost them behind a small tree. As the witness walked behind the tree, he came upon two very tall men standing next to a boulder on the ground. One held his hand on his chest and told the witness not to approach. Suddenly there was a flash of light and the witness felt paralyzed, unable to move. The two men were described as very tall and identical in appearance. With light skin, blue eyes, and light brown shoulder-length hair, they were well-built and strong. They both wore brilliant white tunics with an open V-neck. They spoke to the witness and warned him of a coming catastrophe. They said that the Earth was going to become a cold, desolate planet once more. He was then told to turn around and remain still. He then felt a heat blast behind him and saw a bright flash. The two men had disappeared. Later at home, he realized that he had lost three hours of time and could only remember seeing a long, sleek submarine-like object that used energy from the water for its propulsion. My father and brother are, or are were dock builders in the New York City area. Dock builders work closely with hard hat divers. They're even in the same union. One of the divers was following a cable along the bottom in the East River in zero visibility. He came across something on top of the cable, two soft cylindrical things. He followed them up with his hands till they met at a larger soft mass that sloped upward to a hard round object. He felt around the round object until his thumb sank all the way into the eye sockets. He immediately called to be pulled up, and the police were called. A cable was put under the arms to lift the poor sap out of the river. The cable lifted, caught for a minute, and then came free. The guy had cinder blocks on his feet and was quite overripe. Classic case of the old cement shoes. The diver threw his expensive gloves into the river. I got a lot of good, nauseating dock builder stories. I was stationed on the USS America, CV-66, during Vietnam as a photo interpreter. Every man on the ship at one point or another has midwatch at various posts around the ship. My midwatch duty post for the transition was on the starboard side, on a gantry suspended below the superstructure. I was standing on a metal grate twenty feet below the island and about five, ten feet away from the outswell of the main hull, as it curved up to meet the flight deck, the water was visible through the metal grate, some sixty feet below me. We were transitioning the Sunda Strait, steaming from Subic Bay on our way to Yankee Station off the coast of Vietnam. Now, it being wartime, at night we ran silent and dark. Basically, this means that the ship was moving at a slow enough speed to not make any discernible wake, and the only lights visible were the red or green lights at the bow and stern and a white light at the top of the tallest radio mast. So here I am, pitch black, dead of night, 
No moon standing on a catwalk some sixty feet off the water when I see a strange light coming from the water ahead of us, probably ten, fifteen feet away from the side of the ship. The light wasn't making any substantial movement and seemed to be flickering in the darkness, so I got curious and decided to wait. As we came closer, I could see what it actually was. A little old man of indeterminate Indonesian heritage sitting in a dugout canoe with what appeared to be his grandson, their terrified faces backlit by a simple fish oil lamp, mouths agape. In a moment, I felt my perspective shift. Here I was with my grandson doing God only knows what, miles from shore on a moonless night. I can't see what it is, but I feel an imposing presence passing by me. A low thrum that I can feel more than hear as the stars are winking out, blocked from my vision by something huge passing directly overhead. They just sat there, visibly terrified as they passed close by under my feet, and I watched them as we went by. They never moved any closer to the ship than they had been at the outset, and the only disturbance was when the very slight wake from the stern caused the little winking light to bob up and down ever so gently before the little old man and his dugout canoe disappeared from view. My family has been deep sea fishing ever since I can remember. One trip we were fishing off the 60 mile bank off San Diego, fishing spot way out in the ocean, and hooked into a really frenzied bite of rockfish. Back in those days, limits on rockfish were pretty high, and people were pulling them in hand over fist. The cap got on the horn and basically told everyone to start reeling in your lines because we were being run off the fishing spot. I thought maybe the Mexican authorities had told us to move, or we were moving to a new spot, but five minutes later, the U.S. Ranger hove into view, running hot fighter takeoffs and landings. They didn't want to change course to go around us, and we didn't want to move from there off a great fishing spot that 100 people were filling limits of beautiful rock caught on. Ultimately, the law of the sea won, of course, which is, when a USN supercarrier tells you to move, you move. It was really cool, actually, because they just slipped by very close to us, and we got to watch F-14s land and get fired off the cat. The boat was chartered by Maya and full of all his old Navy buddies, so the story started about Nam and all the guys who worked at North Island Naval Station talking about which carrier captains were ducks and which were cool. We jumped right back on the fish after they blew through, and they ran us off that same spot two more times that day. It was a beautiful day on the sea. Great fishing, as everyone got limits of super tasty fish, and we had our own private moving air show where the fighter jockeys got to show their stuff. United States Navy vet here. Back in 2005, while on the U.S. Harper's Ferry Ells 49, we were deployed near Thailand and one time at night, about 2 a.m., we saw what looked like huge green glowing orbs under the water, about 10 to 50 feet across scattered all over the entire ocean, as far as we could see. The green glowing orbs would pulsate on and off like some underwater alien orb or UFO. As we drove through them, it would turn the green glow into blue and the glow would ride the waves. At that point, we realized it was massive concentrations of bioluminescent algae that we were driving through. Definitely one of the coolest things I've ever seen in my life. I went camping with some friends near Loch Lomond in Scotland. We set up camp about three miles into the woods near a small river and got the fire going to cook some food we brought with us. The site was very remote, but in evening a couple of guys hiked through and stopped to chat. They were from Poland and seemed friendly enough, but asked a lot of questions about our group, how many we were, etc., which left my a bit suspicious, but I put it down to different cultures. 
At about 10 p.m., I started to feel very ill and thinking it was possibly food poisoning or poorly cooked meat. I never cooked it. Decided I would be better getting my fiancé to pick me up. We lived about an hour away by car. My friends were all pretty drunk and I had drunk about four or five cans of Budweiser. Stupidly, I packed my bag after throwing up hard for 15 minutes and decided to hike back to the main road with light fading. I'm about a mile into the hike back, and at this point, I've been sick twice, and I'm completely sobered up by all the throwing up. I've got a sports bottle full of water and stopped for a drink to wash my mouth out. At this point, it's near pitch black, so I go into my bag to get out my torch. Small knife and my point twenty twenty. Two air gun I brought for snagging a rabbit. As I start zipping my bag back up, I hear twigs snap nearby and assume it's a rabbit or a fox. I shine my torch and see nothing, but at this point I'm not worried and carry on. Five minutes later, I hear what sounds like running maybe 100 yards behind me and a lot of twigs snapping. I turn around to assume it's my friends who are messing with me. I call out, I know someone is there, and I shit you not, see movement in the tree is possibly 70, 80 feet away. It looked like a blue Gore-Tex waterproof. I don't remember any of my mates wearing this color. At this point, the sickness is gone. My heart is pounding in my chest. The hair on my neck is standing up, and I get this feeling that I can only describe as feeling almost dizzy at the surreal position I'm in. I take off my rucksack and hang at a stump of a tree and kill my torch. I've got my knife in my jacket pocket, and I've got the pistol gripped harder than my cock when I was 14. I walk in the darkness for about 100 yards and stop dead behind a tree and wait. I'm trying my hardest to control my breathing, which is pretty difficult at this point. Sure enough, I hear movement somewhere again. Very difficult to pinpoint, but it's getting closer. At this point, I'm caught in two minds to continue to hide or to confront. I decide the latter and burst out the bush, flashlight on and weapon ready. I point my torch in the general direction of noise, and there are some branches moving. I start moving towards the area like a SAS trooper with my pathetic twenty-two. I hear movement in the distance, with a lot of twigs breaking. I don't actually see anything or anyone, but at this point, even if it is one of my friends, I'm shooting the bastard. Silence again, and I wait a few minutes and head back for my backpack. It's not hanging over the branch stump anymore. It's on the ground below it, and that's probably the scariest part for me, because whatever I had been chasing could never have beat me back to my bag. So something or someone else had to move it. The branch was intact as was the strap on the bag, so assuming I hung it up correctly, which I honestly can't recall, something else was nearby. At this point, I tabbed out of there onto the main road, pretty sharpish, with no incident. My fiancé was waiting at a lodge nearby to pick me up, at which point I was violently sick. I told her about it, and she was pretty freaked out. To this day, I don't know exactly what happened. If I was trolled by a friend or a fox or whatever, I do know that I absolutely shit myself. I lived about 40 miles in the middle of nowhere, Kansas, for the first 22 years of my life. It was great. One snowy winter night, I was at the house with a girlfriend watching TV in my room. We were the only two there. There was a fresh six inches of snow on the ground that was untouched, and it was starting to blizzard again. About two hours into the night, there is a sudden, violently loud knocking on my window. I jumped out of my skin. She screams and pulled the covers over her head. I grabbed my phone and called my dad. He is a prankster and figured my mother and him just got home, and he wanted to have some fun. I tell him, good job. He really scared us. Huh? What are you talking about? We are still in town at Dillon's, and we might have to stay here because of the storm. Oh, snap. I grabbed my shotgun and put on my hat that had a built-in headlamp. I opened the front door and can't see but ten foot in front of me. No cars parked in the drive, and no tracks either. I walked slowly around the house, around to where my room was.
I saw footprints, fresh footprints, that walked from the back of the house to my window, then back where they came. Shit just got real. I followed them around the house, shotgun shouldered. They curved left and right up the rear step to the back door, back down and around the other side of the house. Then just went off into the darkness headed north. Went back um, the house, locked the doors, and did teenager stuff. Next morning, I followed the faint remains for about a mile to where a dirt road was, where the wind had blown them away. Never figured out who it was. Last summer, I was out in the woods behind my house. I live in a town of 2,000 people, and the houses are very spread out. Most of the town is woods. Anyway, I was sitting there watching the sunset when I heard a strange noise. Normally, it is dead quiet there besides wind and birds and stuff. I heard a buzzing sound. Then I saw it, a drone. A drone was flying over me. Then it saw me and stopped facing me, just hovering there. Some mega creeper was watching me with his drone. I was really creeped out, so I stood up to leave. Yeah, the drone followed me. Who does that? I'm a park ranger, but I'm leaving my name and the name of the park out of this post intentionally. The names of all those involved have been changed as well. I needed to get this story out there, but cannot rely on conventional avenues. That's why I'm posting it here. I could lose my job or much worse, but this story has to be told. I owe it to Catherine, not her real name. I arrived at the ranger station like any other day. I was given my section of the park to patrol. Unfortunately, the park is massive and my section usually includes half of it. So there isn't much chance for leisurely strolls on the trails. I hopped in my work vehicle, a 10-year-old 4x4, and headed out to see if anyone needed assistance. It didn't take long to find someone. At the first campground, there was a man who couldn't get his camper started. A quick jump got him rolling along. Next was a couple needing directions, then an overturned canoe. I had only made it a few miles through the park. I was going to have to move if I hoped to make a full route today. I managed to grab a few quick bites of lunch and put some miles on without anyone needing help when the call came over the radio. There was a hiker that found something and I needed to go check it out. A half hour later I was talking to a middle-aged woman who had made a concerning discovery. She found a hat and a note on the trail. I read the note. I'm writing this note and leaving it behind because I'm not sure what's happening. The five of us friends have been planning this trip forever, even since long before we graduated. But it always seemed like something came up at the last minute and one or more of us couldn't go. For a while, I was almost convinced that some outside force was working against us. That we were cursed not to go camping together until we were all too old to enjoy it. I could picture Devan now. He would still go even if he was so old he had to use a walker on the trail. He's always up for camping. I think the guy carries a loaded backpack in his car with him everywhere he goes. Lol. Adrian got here right behind us followed soon after by Dean. Of course Terry was the last one to show. We started up the trail in great spirits. Three miles in the sun was just starting to heat up. We were making good time towards the rustic campground when Devon decided to take a detour. He said he'd heard about an old trail that no one used anymore and wanted to check it out. I said we should keep going the way we were, but I was outvoted. I honestly don't think Terry's vote should have counted since he was obviously stoned and Devan just bullied him into saying yes. We came to a spot with a large stone off to the side of the trail. Devan said it was the trailhead, but I didn't see any trail. He led us through some heavy brush but on the other side it cleared out and we could see the faint impression of an overgrown trail. I went last and left my hat on the stone in case we got lost and needed to be rescued. I think that's exactly where we're heading, straight toward lost. I'll leave this note under my hat and hope that someone finds us. 
I asked the woman to show me where she'd found it, and she showed me. Three miles later, I was staring at the rock I hoped I would never see again. I radioed my location to the station and told them if they didn't hear from me in a couple of hours to send a search party to the old abandoned trail. I wished I would have brought my supplies with me, my backpack and my sidearm, but they were three miles away and I didn't know how long these kids had been on this trail. I knew that wasted time could mean the difference between life and death. At least I had my knife, flashlight and binox. So I thanked the woman, placed the red hat back on the stone just in case, and headed into the heavy brush. Once through the initial overgrowth, the trail became visible. Old memories flashed through my head. Ones I never wanted to think of again. I took a deep breath and headed down the trail. It was overgrown for the first mile or so, and then it opened up into a field. I could see people had walked through before me by the way the weeds were partially trampled. As I walked through, a deer jumped ahead of me, startling me. Until that moment, I didn't realize how jumpy I was. I tried to settle down and tell myself that these kids were just lost, and I could catch up to them and get them out. Telling myself that didn't make the memories go away. I entered a clearing with a fallen log and another note with a rock sitting on it. I think I'm being silly. This trail isn't so bad. Maybe I was wrong. Devon seems to know where he's going. I just can't shake this feeling that we're being watched. Sometimes I'll look around and I swear I see a face disappear behind a tree. Am I being paranoid? Maybe if the birds would start singing again that would lighten my mood. But I haven't heard a bird or any other animal for a while. I wonder why they're being so quiet. Are they afraid of us? On another note, Terry seems to be brooding more than usual. Maybe he forgot to bring enough of his stash to last the trip. Devon is in his glory since everyone has to rely on him for directions. Adrian and Dean seem to be along for the ride. Although I have noticed Dean looking around at the trees as well. Maybe I'll ask him if he sees anything. If you're trying to track us down, I hope we aren't being too much bother. I just have this feeling. I folded the note and stuck it in my pocket, then prayed she was wrong about being followed. I pushed on, beginning to miss my backpack with the supplies in it, especially the water bottles. The trees provided some shade so the sunlight wasn't shining directly on me, but hiking is always thirsty work. The birds chirping in the trees made me almost forget about the desperate mission I was on to save these five kids. My mind wandered back to the kid I couldn't save. It had been shortly after I started as a park ranger. An eleven-year-old boy had gotten lost on this very trail. His parents searched frantically for him before calling us in to look. I remember hoping to be the one to find him as we formed search parties and searched on in and around every inch of the trail. In the end, I got my wish. I found him, but I wish I hadn't. I pushed the memory to the back of my mind and focused on the trail. It was starting to fade. The trampling of feet wasn't making enough of a difference and I was starting to lose my way. Out here, that can be deadly. I kept moving forward and finally regained the trail just in time to reach the fork. I looked back and forth from one choice to the other and couldn't see a difference between the two. I searched for any broken twigs or plants that would give me a hint, but there were none. Just when I was about to give up and flip a coin, I saw a piece of paper in the weeds barely visible. I dug it out and read it, it seems like we have a dilemma a fork in the road as it were. You would think I would be happy to see the doubt in Devan's eyes as he looked from one choice to the other, but you'd be wrong. It made my confidence plummet. It made me think that we were never getting out of here. Everyone's running out of water, Devan yelled at us for not conserving, but I saw him drink the last of his two. He ranted and raved at us for a while, but we all knew that he was just mad because he didn't know what to do. In the end, he flipped a coin. We all did our best not to laugh. Adrian is reaching the end of her rope with Devan and his attitude. 
Dean has been playing peacemaker, trying to keep them from going at it too much. Terry has been way too quiet. I haven't seen him light up once. Something's up with him, but every time I ask he says it's nothing. The birds still aren't singing, and it's starting to really bother me. The strange feeling I have hasn't gone away. I asked Dean if he had seen anything strange, but he won't talk about it. We've been on this trail for a while. I'm hoping to come to the end soon. By the way, in case the note got moved or blown around, we took the left trail. I was panicked by the end of reading that note and so relieved she mentioned which trail to take. I radioed in and reported that I was on the trail of the missing hikers. I mentioned the fork and taking the left side. I was told that there was no search party going on yet, that I was the only one looking for these kids. It was the complete opposite of years ago looking for that kid. Everyone was searching. I know we combed every inch of that wilderness, but that's the thing about the woods. You can search every nook and cranny, but something can still stay hidden. The sun was going down and I still had no idea how close I was to catching up to these kids. I could stumble across them in the next clearing, or they could be hours ahead of me. I met with the woman who showed me the hat and note in the afternoon. If they started out around daybreak, they could be a good five or six hours ahead of me. If the leader is so driven to continue, it's hard to say how far they might be. I continued following the trail until I came to a fallen tree across a river. I looked both ways along the edge of the water, but saw no trail, so I made my way across the tree. I could picture the debate the kids had when they got here. I chuckled at the thought of Devan having to convince them to go across. I believe I made up a lot of time with that single crossing. I jumped down to the water and drank my fill, then climbed back up feeling much better. It was tough to pick up the trail on the other side. I was glad to find a note sticking to a branch. Oh my gosh, Devan just about came unglued when we got to that tree over the river. He hopped up on it right away and started across. But the rest of us weren't so sure the trail led that way. We asked him how a trail could be planned with a fallen tree as part of it. He sputtered and stomped and told us how lost we'd be without him. Dean had finally had enough and told him we were lost because of him. I seriously thought Devan was going to take a swing at him until Terry of all people came to his side and told Devan to shut up. The rest of us all came together and told Devon he could keep leading us as long as he stopped acting like a petty tyrant. He didn't take it well. In the end, he told us we could all go to hell. He sat on the log and refused to move. Eventually, after we took a break and refilled our water bottles in the river, Dean said we should get going and let us across the tree. Devon followed along acting like a whipped puppy. Dean and I talked about the disappearing face we'd seen a while back, but neither of us had seen it again. At least the birds are back to singing. I chuckled figuring that Devan would be a big baby over the whole thing. But after the chuckle came concern. Deposed leaders are usually dangerous. I wondered how much offense Devon had taken, and if he would be looking to get some payback in some small or large way. Darkness was coming on fast in the woods. I had to make a decision. Camp for the night or keep going. If I camped, I could defend against the predators that lurked in the darkness. But if I kept moving, there was a good chance I could stumble across the group before daybreak. It wasn't much of a decision. These kids that I didn't even know, that I had plunged headfirst into the woods without even my backpack of supplies. Of course, I was going to try to catch up with them. If I had done that years back, would that kid still be alive? Such thoughts nagged at me. Most days I kept them at bay, but here in this same forest, close to the spot where I found him, I needed to focus. If I'm going to keep after them, then I need to get going. I stepped off the trail to take a piss and heard a metallic snap at the same time I felt intense pain shoot up my leg. I looked down and I had stepped into a bear trap. I screamed, fell to the ground and rocked back and forth in agony. 
After a few minutes, I focused on getting the trap off my leg. I found a branch and pried the trap open, screaming the entire time. I managed to pull the trap off my leg and threw it to the side. I really didn't want to take my boot off, but I had to see the damage. It took every ounce of effort I could muster to unlace the boot and pull it off. My leg was purple. I felt along the wound very gently, but there didn't seem to be any break. That didn't mean I wasn't going to be limping for the next month. But it did mean I would buy this brand of boots for the rest of my life. It took much more effort and some more screaming to put the boot back on, but I knew I needed to keep moving. I laced up the boot and found a sturdy branch to use as a crutch. I struggled to my feet and took my first few ginger steps. Once I got into a rhythm, it got easier, but I couldn't walk as fast as I had been. Of course, when I was at my weakest was when I heard footsteps in the trees close to me. I knew there was a predator around just because it could sense I was vulnerable. I leaned against a tree and held my crutch ready as a weapon. The footsteps came closer. They paused as if they knew I was ready, then slowly continued stalking me. They were deliberate but slow. Each step seemed measured as if waiting for the right moment to strike. I heard it right next to the tree I was hiding behind. I whipped around as best I could and raised my crutch to strike. A deer stared at me for a heartbeat and then turned and ran through the forest. I collapsed against the tree and slid down to the ground, allowing the adrenaline to bleed off. I don't remember falling asleep. I woke to sandpaper scraping the side of my face. I opened my eyes and there was a bear beside me licking my cheek. I freaked out, screamed and rolled away from it. The bear wasn't ready for that reaction. It startled and ran away. I slowed my rapid breathing and looked around. It was dark. There were thin shafts of moonlight beaming through the trees providing a little light. I checked my watch and it was nearly four in the morning. I rose slowly and gingerly on my injured ankle, took the small flashlight out of my pocket and prayed it still worked. My prayers were answered when the beam shone brightly through the woods. I panned around trying to get my bearings. After a moment I found the trail and started hobbling toward it. The nightly noises were a comfort. At least if the crickets were chirping and the rest of the forest was singing its nightly tune, that meant predators weren't around. I stumbled and fell, hitting my injured ankle against a rock. The pain overwhelmed me and I screamed. After a few minutes of recovery, I got up and continued at a slower pace, paying more attention to the ground. I chided myself for falling asleep and losing so much time. At least the trail was easy to follow. I continued on through the night, hoping I wasn't too late. I started thinking about the boy I'd failed to rescue and what would happen if I failed to rescue these kids. I'm sure the ranger's department would say I did my best. I wasn't worried about them, it was me. Would I be able to forgive myself for letting something happen again? My thoughts were interrupted when I stumbled into a clearing. Not just any clearing. There were the remnants of a fire. There were impressions from tent pegs being pulled out of the ground. All around were the signs of a very recent campsite, including a tent that was still set up. I got so excited I nearly fell over my crutch looking around for signs of anything. The tent was a mixed blessing. It was very ominous that it was still here while the others were gone, but I was able to find some supplies to take along for my search. The most important was food. I shoved some protein bars in my pocket while devouring some beef jerky. I also grabbed two bottles of water from the pack. I stumbled across a note sitting under a rock beside the smoldering fire. Before I sat, I held my hand out to the fire. It was still warm, but the embers were nearly dead. It had been hours since it was first lit. If I hadn't taken my unintentional nap, I would have caught up with them. There was nothing I could do but sit by the dying fire and read the note, hoping there was good news. We found this clearing and decided to camp. Everyone was tired from walking and the mood was somber because no one seemed to know where we were. 
All of us had been hiking in this forest before, but none of us had ever seen or heard of this trail. We set up our tents and started a fire, then had some supper and sat around. No one really felt like talking, so I tried to get the ball rolling by asking Terry why he was late. He hesitated, but at my prompting eventually, he told us that he had hit an animal with his car on the way here. I asked if it was a deer, and he said no, it was much too big to be a deer. He said it walked upright on two legs, and it was massive, like eight feet tall, covered in brown hair. He swerved to miss it, but the strangest thing was it seemed to try to jump in front of him anyway, like it wanted him to stop. We all listened with rapt attention. Just then off in the distance, we heard a scream. We all froze. Devon started spouting off and yelling at Terry for trying to scare us, then he stormed off. Dean tried to stop him, but he pushed him away and disappeared in the woods. The rest of us talked trying to decide if we should go look for him, but in the end, we figured we should just let him go and cool off. A short while later we heard a rustling off in the distance and a muffled cry. We huddled a little closer together and went on high alert. Our eyes darted back and forth as we searched the impenetrable wall of trees surrounding us looking for any sign of a predator. Right then the strangest thing happened. All the nightly noises stopped. The crickets, the squirrels, the owls, every sound that you usually hear in the forest at night simply ceased. It was unnerving. For a moment I wondered if I hadn't gone deaf. Our eyes darted all around in the darkness. We all huddled closer to the fire. Dean pulled out his hunting knife. None of us said a word. It was like if we spoke something bad would happen. Somehow whatever caused the noises to stop would find us if we spoke. Someone did speak though, just not who we expected. Why are you here? came a raspy deep voice that seemed to echo from everywhere. We looked all around and finally, a man stepped into the light. He was large, well over six feet tall with broad shoulders and older, maybe in his fifties or sixties. He was also wearing a park ranger's uniform. It looked old and shabby like he had been wearing it for a long time. There were no name tag or park patches. At that point, we didn't care. We had been rescued. We clamored around him saying how glad we were that he had found us. We told him about going on the trail and how we weren't sure where we even were. The man listened and slowly said, you shouldn't be here. We all looked at each other. I'm sure the others thought the same as me. No shit, we shouldn't be here, we just told you that. He continued to look at us from one to the other as though sizing us up. I was starting to get a little uncomfortable with his silence. I would have thought he would offer to guide us, but he didn't. He kept staring. I think everyone else was getting a little edgy as well when Dean asked if he could point us in the right direction. He looked at Dean as if deciding to answer him or not. I can guide you, he said, but first you should have some rest. We all agreed that the day had been long and stressful. We decided to take his advice and turn in. We offered him some food and water, but he refused saying he wasn't hungry. We each went to our tents and laid down. Before I settled in and finished this note, I popped my head back out of my tent to check on our guide. He was sitting by the fire staring into the orange coals. I thought I heard him mumbling or maybe humming something softly. I quietly zipped up my tent and went to sleep. Sometime later, someone banged on my tent. I woke and unzipped it to find the ranger with a strange look in his eyes. We need to go. Why? I said, rubbing the sleep out of my eyes. It's not safe here, he said with an edge of panic in his voice. I popped back into my tent to change, then came out and met with everyone. They were all in states of semi-consciousness as well. Everyone but the rangers seemed to be confused. Pack up, we need to leave, he said a little more forcefully. I was about to protest when I heard a piercing scream in the distance. His head shot up and he stared in the direction of the sound. Move it, he said. Pack up, we didn't need to be told again. The scream brought us all fully awake. 
We tore down our tents in record time and packed everything into our backpacks. As I was finishing up, I noticed Devon's tent was still up. Where's Devon, I said. Who's Devon, the ranger said. He's another one of our friends, I said. He went off into the woods alone right before you got here. He didn't come back, the ranger said. Should we go look for him, I said. The ranger extended his arms and did a slow circle. Which way would you go, he said. I understood his point. How would we know where he had gone, if he was still on the path or not? It just seemed like we should do something. What about his gear, I said. Do we take it with us? The ranger looked at me like he was annoyed at having to answer such questions. Leave it here in case he comes back, he said. He'll need his supplies. I'm not sure if I'll keep leaving notes or not now that we have the ranger to guide us. Whoever finds this, please look for Devon and make sure he's okay. A ranger? All the rangers at this park are in their thirties or forties. Maybe it was someone who retired and was just roaming around out there. But why would he be in a ranger outfit? Sitting here by the dying embers of the fire with a tent set up in front of me, it was very tempting to take a rest. If they're in the hands of a capable ranger, I could get some rest before the long hike back out of here. But I knew I had already taken my rest for the night. If not for that, I would have been here hours ago, probably before the other ranger. I set out again feeling tired but determined. The campsite made me more hopeful than I had been all day. At least they were together and thinking like campers. If only I knew who this ranger was. The sun was an hour away from rising, so I took out my flashlight to follow the trail. I zipped up the tent before I left, just in case its owner did come back. Wouldn't want animals getting in and taking everything. It's bad enough when injured park rangers do it. The trail stayed level for a while as dawn peeked over the trees. The trail started heading upward, which was bad news for me and my bum ankle. It made things harder, but I had my trusty makeshift crutch to help me. Dawn crept into the forest, giving me a little assistance. At least I wouldn't have to waste a hand holding a flashlight. As the climb grew steeper, the trail grew more narrow. At times it was only the width of one foot. I held onto trees and whatever I could as I scaled the extremely narrow trail. At the most difficult I paused and seriously considered turning back. As I looked around for any other way to keep going, I saw brightly colored fabric at the bottom of the ravine. I carefully balanced as I took out my binoculars and looked. It was a backpack and attached to it was the body of a girl in her early twenties. She looked like she had hit her head on the rocks at the bottom. Her face was bloody and mauled. Her clothes were ripped and soaked in blood. There was no doubt an animal had gotten to her. The only question was, was she alive when it started feeding on her? I looked away but felt my determination double to find these missing kids. They might be with a ranger, but they were still in terrible danger. I slowly continued up the narrow trail. At times I was sure the ground would give out from under me, and I would share the same fate as the poor unfortunate girl at the bottom of the ravine. It was then I remembered my radio. I tried to call in and report the location of the body, but the only response I got was static. I determined to try again when I got to the top of the trail. It was yet another motivation to keep going, to be careful, to survive. It seemed like hours at a snail's pace working my way up the side of that ravine. Finally, I clawed my way over the edge to the top. I rolled over onto solid ground and lay there for a few minutes. Once I caught my breath, I got up slowly and painfully. I hadn't done my ankle any favors. I limped toward what looked like the trail and began following. It wasn't long before I came across the remnants of another campsite. The fire was a little warmer than the last one. I stoked it up, threw some more wood on, and got it going. I knew I needed some rest. I searched around and found a note, then sat down on a log by the fire to read it. I can't believe Adrian's gone. 
We started up this steep ravine and the trail kept getting more narrow. I asked the ranger if there was any other way around, but he just glared at me and said no. We all struggled with our heavy packs on our backs. At one point I was on all fours just trying to keep from sliding into the ravine. That's when it happened. Adrian was having trouble keeping her feet on the trail. She kept slipping. I reached out and helped her balance a few times. Being right in front of me, I kept an eye on her whenever I could. That wasn't nearly as much as I wanted because I was watching my own feet. She slipped once and I tried to grab her, but she had tipped over and the weight of her backpack dragged her over the side. I watched in horror as she tumbled down into the ravine bouncing off trees as she went. I saw her skull make a solid impact several times as she tumbled to the bottom and slid to a stop. I couldn't see if she was still breathing or not as I called her name. She didn't move. I called for the ranger in front of us and pointed to her unmoving body. He stared at her for a long time. I don't know if he was trying to see if she was alive or not. He told us to keep going up the trail to the top and he would go check on her. I watched as he carefully made his way down the nearly sheer slope. We kept moving forward as instructed. He was only halfway down when we made it to the top. I was a wreck. I was so happy we made it but sad for Adrian. I didn't hold out much hope that the ranger was going to come trotting into camp with her on his back saying she only had a few bumps and bruises. We started a fire and then sat around it in a stupor. Finally, Terry came over and talked to me. Look, I understand she was your friend, but she was ours too, he said. We need to work together to get out of here for them. That's so stupid it makes sense, I said with the remnants of a smile. It was then the ranger reappeared. He sat by the fire and didn't say a word. There was something in his eyes, it wasn't sadness, but I don't know exactly what it was. We knew she wasn't coming back. We rested for a little while, then started out on the trail again. If you're following us, I hope you're being careful. Stay safe. Wow, this girl is something else. With all she's gone through, she still wants me to be safe. I hope I find her. I think she'd make a good ranger. My guilty conscience jumped up on my back and yelled at me. How can you sit around and rest when that poor girl just lost her friend and needs your help? I knew it was right. I just didn't know why that other ranger was being so careless. I struggled to get up, kicked out the fire, and started after them. The daylight was dimming, but it was only eight in the morning. I looked up and saw why. Storm clouds were overtaking the sky. Yet another reason I wish I would have brought my backpack. The raindrops hit like a cold slap in the face. Even though it was still September, out here in the mountains the weather can change in a heartbeat. We weren't at the top of the mountain, but in the middle was enough for the weather change to make me shiver. Now that we were out of the ravine, I tried my radio again, but it was just static. I knew there were some places where the radio inexplicably wouldn't work. I just hoped to get away from the interference before it was too late. The trail was clear in front of me, but that was little comfort when walking in open fields with no rain cover. All those trees I tromped through and now in the rain I have wide open spaces. I'd say someone doesn't like me. The rain didn't just pass like a spring shower. It poured so hard it became difficult to see in front of me. For a long time, I trudged through the rain. At times, it felt like I was walking in place. The mud was starting to cake on my boots, and then my salvation appeared. In front of me on the trail was a tent. I called out before I unzipped the tent and let myself in. I flopped to the wonderful dry floor, then quickly turned and zipped the entrance back up. I breathed a sigh of relief, but as I did, a stench assaulted my nose. I looked over at the sleeping bag. It was full. I'm sorry to barge in like this, but I needed to get out of the rain, I said. No response. I nudged the person in the bag. It tipped to the side and rocked right back. That's when I noticed the splotches of red that had soaked through the bag. 
I didn't want to see, but I pulled the top of the sleeping bag away from the person's face. The bad part was they no longer had a face. It had been ripped away and the neck had been gouged out. There were large wounds on the body as well. I tried to feel for a pulse, but when my fingers went straight into the muscles of the neck, I figured there was no pulse to feel. I wiped my fingers on the sleeping bag and pondered why this person was covered. I know the animal who did this didn't gently cover up the person with the sleeping bag when it was done. I found my answer laying above the head of the person. It was a note. I can't believe Terry's dead. I wish I'd never come on this trip. I wish I'd never let Devan bully us into turning down this damn trail. Where the hell is Devan anyway? When he stormed off on his little pity party, did he run across whatever creature has been stalking us? Is he sitting back in his tent now enjoying himself? I really don't know. We were enjoying not climbing up the face of a ravine, but we were very tired. I mentioned stopping and camping for a little bit to the ranger. He looked around and even sniffed the air. That seemed like a weird thing to do. But after that, he agreed to let us set up camp. He even told us to do it as quickly as we could. We gathered wood for a fire, but he told us not to bother because the rain was coming. I guess that explains the sniffing the air thing. Our tents had been up maybe 15 minutes when it started raining. It quickly turned into a downpour. We all offered the ranger to sit in our tents with us. He looked over us one by one. It was kinda creepy. Finally, he said he would sit with Terry in his tent. Dean and I looked at each other with relieved expressions. The ranger is helping us, but he isn't someone I'd like to ever see again. He just acts too weird. At times I wonder if he's really helping. I just closed my eyes listening to the rain on the tent and letting it carry me off to dreamland when the ranger ripped open my tent. He said we needed to pack up and leave right now that something was hunting us. We dove out into the rain and miserably packed our tents. He reassured us that there was a cave nearby and we could get shelter there. As I was packing up, I didn't see Terry so I went over to his tent and knocked. When there was no answer I went in and found what was left of his body. Something had torn him to shreds. I covered my mouth to keep from vomiting and ran out to tell the others. Dean and the ranger looked in and saw that there was no helping him. The ranger said he had left the tent to go to the bathroom, and when he came back he saw a predator hanging around the tents. That's when he came and woke us. It must have already gotten to Terry. I pulled his sleeping bag over his head and wished we had time to give him a proper burial. But the ranger said the animal might be back for the rest of us. So we quickly packed and left. I barely had time to finish this note. Please help us. A cave. What kind of ranger is he? Doesn't he realize that would be the most likely place a large predator would call home? I thought for a moment what cave he could be talking about. I hadn't been on this trail for five years, ever since I found the kid here. Then it hit me. We were very close to the place where we found him. Why would he take them there unless... I jumped up so quickly that I nearly fell on top of the body when I forgot and put too much weight on my injured ankle. I hobbled out of the tent and went as quickly as I could toward the place I swore I'd never see again. I approached the cave and my heart sank. Two backpacks sat just inside the entrance. I pulled out my knife and flashlight, then cautiously peeked inside. I felt a change in the breeze and turned to find the ranger staring at me. I looked him up and down. You, I said. The last time I saw you was when we found the boy. He said nothing. It was never a random animal attack, I said. It was you. He took a step toward me. Of course it was, he said. How wonderful was it to watch you years ago as you floundered around looking for some predator that stood beside you. You son of a bitch, I pulled out my knife and held it ready. He paused, then smiled. Do you really think that knife can hurt me? I looked at it. Pretty sure, I said. It's made of iron. His smile vanished. So you do know what I am. 
I pulled out a bottle of brown water. I made sure to grab some runoff from the rainstorm, I said. It might not do as good as rust water, but let's find out. I opened the bottle and threw some water at him. He dodged it as though it was acid. At the same time, I swung with a knife. He dodged with ease. Why don't you turn into the big pussy that you are, I said taunting him. Because we both know when I transform I'm vulnerable for a moment, he said. And I'm sure you would love to take advantage of a vulnerable moment. He swung and connected with my stomach, knocking the wind out of me. I recovered and swung the knife in a vicious downswing at him, which he easily dodged. I kept moving forward, stabbing and slashing at him. I couldn't get close enough to connect. He was too fast. You can't defeat me, he said. Look at you like an injured deer just waiting to be devoured. Be quiet, ye nod Lucii, I yelled. At the mention of his name, he froze. I knew I didn't have much time. I took advantage of the moment, lunging at him with my knife. If I had been uninjured, I would have closed the distance between us with two quick steps and buried the knife in his heart. Unfortunately, in the heat of the moment, I forgot about my injured ankle. I stepped forward on my good leg, then faltered when I tried to put weight on the injured one. Instead of burying the knife in his heart, it went through his left thigh. He screamed in pain and ran out of the cave. I took out my flashlight and started toward the back of the cave. There I found a body next to a pile of bones. There was a note in her hand. I sat down, took it and read. I can't believe how stupid I was not to see this much sooner. All the time guiding us was just a ploy. He never wanted to help us. He never cared about any of us or our safety. I need to write this quickly before he comes back. The ranger led us here and told us to wait, that we'd be safe in the cave. He left us alone. Dean pulled out his flashlight and explored deeper into the cave. He found a large pile of bones. Off to the side of them was a pile of clothes. We ran toward the opening, but the ranger had returned. So you didn't listen, he said, leering at us. I told you to stay here, not explore my home. What are you, I said. He smiled for the first time since I'd met him. But his smile wasn't comforting, it was terrifying. I watched in horror as he changed into a giant cat creature. It didn't look quite like a panther or mountain lion. He lunged at us with amazing speed. He grabbed my leg and tore a large gash in it. I fell to the floor screaming. Dean tried to defend me, swinging his knife around and holding it at bay, but it stalked around him and cornered him. He only had one chance. He looked at me with sadness in his eyes and then ran past the creature and out of the cave. It looked at me and my leg then sprinted out after Dean. I know why he did it. He was trying to give me time to escape but with my leg, there was no way I could outrun that thing. What he actually did was give me time to say goodbye. If you're reading this, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry I led you to your death. If you do somehow survive and make it out of here, please tell our families what really happened here. Goodbye. I fought back tears as I read the final words of this brave girl. I limped to the front of the cave and looked out as the rain stopped. It was like seeing a new world being born. I tried my radio and got an immediate answer. I gave them my GPS coordinates and told them to prepare for casualties. I'm still a park ranger even months later. I made sure that the trail was sealed off. I carry an iron knife and rust water with me at all times. I carry the rust water in a squirt gun just in case. The bones were removed from the cave and subjected to Deanna testing. Aside from this group of victims, including Devan, there were several other people who had gone missing in the park over the years. The official version of the events was that a rogue animal had been hunting people. I was told it would be best for my career if I didn't reveal the true nature of the predator. I still search for the creature and post signs everywhere to be on the lookout for an older ranger wearing a uniform with no patches on it. There's a number to call if anyone spots him. 
It's my personal cell phone number. From time to time I hear reports of a large cat that's limping on its hind leg. I try to make my way to that spot as quickly as possible, but I have yet to catch him. I posted this story in memory of that brave girl, but also as a warning. Never go on an unposted trail, and beware of those you meet in the woods even if they wear a uniform. This story comes from one of my friends who used to be ranger at the national park I work at, and not from my personal experience. I've asked him to tell me his scariest experience at the job, and it just so happened to be his last. For immersion's sake, I'll tell it from the first person view. My normal shifts were during the day 9-5 like most people, but on that day we were short-handed on the night shift staff because the last person who worked during those hours had just quit. We had lately had a whole lot of people quitting the night shift, so that meant I had to cover. Weirdly enough, I had never had to work the graveyard shift before then, and I was actually excited for it. I had brought some coffee and five-hour energy with me because the hours ran 10-5, and there was no way I'd make it that far naturally. I got to my tower right before 10 when it was already pitch black and the cold July night had fully set in. The tower was fairly tall with several flights of stairs leading up to the top. The whole thing was mostly surrounded by thick forest except for the trail I came in from and a murky pond that was just to the right of one of the tower's legs. The pond itself was covered in those little frog pads and had algae floating around over the surface. It was actually quite big for a natural lagoon. I climbed up and all I could hear was the non-stop sounds of crickets, frogs, and the occasional owl. When I hit the top, I fumbled with my keys until I finally found the right one and walked right on in. The one room was small and square-shaped, three of the walls were mostly glass and the other one was opaque and had the door I just came in. The roof went up like a pyramid for a short length until it peaked, and it was all made of wood. To my left was a nicely made bed and a nightstand with a lamp and a flashlight on top, not like I'd be using the bed though. On the wall next to that was my CB radio and communications stand, which every one of those towers had. Next to that sat my refrigerator and microwave, which was part of a small kitchen that extended to the other wall as well. Inside the kitchen on the right wall were several cabinets, some small ones that held snacks and some canned foods, and another set of giant cabinets that I couldn't open, which likely had vacuums and other cleaning supplies that were above my pay grade. Roomy. I went over to the communication stand and did my standard check to make sure everything was properly working. I called into the ranger stations channel and said, Well, Donnie, it looks like it's just you and me tonight. Donnie didn't say anything back, so I figured he was just taking a shit. I went and grabbed the flashlight on the stand and reached into one of its drawers, pulling out a set of binoculars from it. I went back out onto the balcony and checked to make sure no fire hazards or any other kind of dangerous things were over there. Once I checked that box of off my to-do list, I headed back inside and pulled out the chair from the communication stand and put it by one of the glass walls and grabbed a granola bar from one of the kitchen cabinets to munch on. I put the binoculars up to my eyes and looked over the surrounding forest. It didn't seem like any animals were up and about, and no birds were in the sky either. I skimmed over a couple of clearings to make sure that no teenagers were off camping illegally. Then I went and peeked over at a far ridge where I saw a snowman standing alone in a gap of the trees. Hold the F up. It was July. I peeked again to see it wasn't a snowman, but some kid in a shitty ghost costume. It looked like the ones from Charlie Brown, with the big black holes for eyes that looked more like they were colored black than actual holes. The kid was still and staring right into my direction, unmoving. I couldn't see the kid's parents anywhere, and by now it was rolling up on eleven, so that meant something was up. 
I broke contact on the kid and walked to the radio, calling into the station. Donnie, you off the shitter yet? Barely made it out, but I'm here. I chuckled. Donnie was always good for a laugh. There's some kid with a blanket walking around the southeast sector, and they look alone. A blanket? What the hell are you talking about? It's a ghost costume. It's got the black holes for eyes and stuff. You mean like the Charlie Brown cost? Can you check it out? Yeah, I'll go out and see what's up. I'll call in on the walkie-talkie to tell you what I see. Roger that. I turned off the radio and crossed over to the nightstand drawer to grab the walkie-talkie. Once I had it, I sat back down in the chair and put the binoculars to my eyes, zooming in to where the kid was. The ridge was empty, with no kid in sight, which I knew would make this a thousand times harder. I pulled up the antennae on the walkie-talkie and dialed to the right channel. Donnie, you hear me? Yep, loud and clear, I'm getting close to the sector. I'm heading up to a ridge for a vantage point. Perfect, that's where I saw the kid, but they've moved on since then. Well, I'll just check around to see if I can find anything. I watched as Donnie came over the ridge, waving his flashlight around the dark, until he looked towards the tower and shrugged. Nothing over here. Damn, hopefully he turns up again. Until then, I'll just notify the police and check with any missing reports. All right, I'll go back to Donnie's voice cut out, and I saw his flashlight turn off in the distance. The small lit-up spot where he stood was swallowed in darkness. Donnie, you there? Donnie, I heard no response, and I rushed outside the door and around the corner to where I saw him, yelling his name, only to hear my voice echo into the woods, and that's when it hit me. There wasn't a single other sound in that entire forest. The crickets and frogs had stopped chirping, the wind didn't rustle through the leaves, everything was completely standstill. I could hear my heartbeat throbbing in my ears and nothing else. I moved my flashlight around the woods for some futile attempt at finding him. I got into that state of mind where I got so scared my throat closed up, and if I moved I felt like something very bad was gonna happen. I had to do something now. I turned around and as I did, I glanced at the stairs below me. At the bottom stood a skinny, horrifically angled woman. She was tall, dripping with water, with black hair and dark, murky blue skin that stretched across her bent and broken bones. Her gray dress was shredded and her black shoes were muddy and wet. And her face, her eyes were milky white and her mouth hung wide open like a snake, like her jaw had been grossly broken. She let out a blood-curdling and ear-piercing scream of agony and began to shuffle up the stairs so fast that I snapped out of my fear lock and I ran the F back inside, slamming and locking the door behind me. There was no way she could run that fast, even if all of her bones weren't broken into wrong directions. I ran back to the kitchen and grabbed the biggest knife I could find, and then I pulled out the walkie-talkie, screaming into it. Is anyone there? Donnie, where the F are you? Someone answer me, got him, Nit. Then I heard the creaking of a door. I slowly turned, and I froze when I saw what was there. The door was still there, locked and shut, and had been completely undisturbed. What scared me was the once locked giant cabinet that now stood open, with a kid dressed like a Charlie Brown ghost standing just in front of it. I stood there, unmoving, until I heard the little shit giggle. I recognized that giggle. No way. I pulled off the sheet to see one of Donnie's kids, Marvin, sporting a smirk and a walkie-talkie. Dad. Joey. I got him. Ah. Pissed his pants just like I said he would write. He and his other son laughed from the other end of the walkie. I was mad, but glad that I wasn't about to get murdered in a goddamn wooden tower. I grabbed his walkie and shot back. Pissed me off is what you did, you asshole. I hope you're happy. Hearing you scream like a little girl sure did make me happy, all right? Yes, yeah, screw you too. That wasn't even me. That was your stupid zombie chick. Who was that, your wife? My what? Does the ghost look like a zombie from that far away? 
You said yourself it looked like Charlie. Not the ghost dumbass, the woman on the stairs. She screamed and ran up them so that she could scare me into the tower. Hell, she must be like an Olympic runner. Did you get Usain Ball? Dean, I didn't put no woman on the stairs. Upon hearing that he would have the night shift for the next couple of weeks until they found a replacement, my friend quit and vowed never to return to that park. To this day, he swears that either Donnie never told him about that part being a prank, or that he saw something entirely unrelated. I began to question my own participation in the night shifts, and consider myself lucky that the few times I've been on it, I had been stationed at the north and eastern sectors. Part 2 There have been few occasions where I have actually taken the night shift. Most of the time I wrongfully pass out in the provided bed and wait until my shift ends. This story actually takes place during one of those occasions. I was fast asleep in the bed even though the mattress was hard and didn't adjust to my back. I had done my sight check and stared at the woods for about half an hour, but time moves on and my attention wavers, so I came up with sleeping as my one solution to boredom. In an instant I realized I was awake, and I immediately sat up in the bed. Something had woken me up. It was one of those occasions where something loud happens and you wake up, but don't process it in time to register what it was. Whatever it was, it must have been loud. Glancing towards my alarm clock, I could see that it was 3.21 am. I rubbed my eyes of what little sleepiness was still in me and looked around to see if maybe something had fallen. Everything seemed to be in place, but the lights were off and my nocturnal vision is less than supreme. I heard something shut. The tower door. The door was wide open, flapping in the wind. That must have been it. I left the door open a little and a strong gust of wind must have thrown it open and against the wall. I guess it wasn't anything closing after all. That gust of wind was now going through the room and disturbing my warm temperature. I rolled off my sheets and hopped out of bed towards the door. I pushed it with some force towards the wall, hoping to recreate the sound and trigger a memory. But the door didn't even reach all the way to the wall, its hinge keeping it firm. I shut the door fully this time and went back to my stone-hard sleeping spot. I was able to fall back into a doze fairly quickly before I was awoken again by what I assumed to be the exact same thing. I still didn't hear it. I looked towards the door and saw that it still remained shut, unperturbed since I last saw it. The alarm clock read 3.39. I had only been asleep for 18 minutes. I grew annoyed at the thought of not being able to fall asleep and got up to search the kitchen. Being the same kitchen as every other tower's, I could easily locate and check off each item I found as not being the culprit. All knives still in their holder, the microwave off, blender unplugged. The toaster didn't seem to be the cause, so that meant it probably wasn't an electronic making the noise. The floor was clean and all cabinets were shut. I was truly clueless and gave up my search to head to sleep. I sat under my covers, still awake, now in day mode because of all of my detective work. Then I heard it. It was a scream. A scream that sounded like a car tire stuck screeching on asphalt. I was only able to identify it as a vocal product because of the changes in pitch, going up and down in its high tone. It sounded inhuman, blood-curdling and agonizing. I jumped out of the bed, tripping on my covers and looked around, by now the screaming had stopped, but it was so loud that I knew it had to be coming from inside. I looked back to the kitchen, whatever it was must be in there. I looked from the appliances on the counter, to the drawers and utensils that were laid out, to the two giant cabinets that were at the other end of the kitchen. The office joker Donnie was on vacation in Hawaii. I had seen him post about it just earlier that day. There was no one else that worked here that was like that which meant this wasn't a prank. I grabbed one of the knives that had sat in the holder and crept my way to the cabinet. I reached one arm to the silver handle, the other poised with a kitchen knife, ready to defend myself. 
I threw open the door and readied myself for an attack. An attack that didn't come. I saw nothing in the cabinet besides a broom and other supplies that were above my pay grade, at first at least, until I glanced downwards to the raccoon that was crouched in the corner. It screamed that monstrous scream, and I tripped backwards as it ran over me to safety under my rock of a bed. Even it knew that mattress was unbreakable. I opened the door again and poked at the raccoon with the broom until it finally ran back outside. So maybe I did hear a door shut after all. Poor thing must have been shut in that there by the wind. It didn't matter, the noise was gone and I was finally able to go back to sleep. I curled under my blankets and rested my head on the pillow in serene peace, completely unaware of the horrific banshee that lied just above me on the ceiling. I'm kidding about the banshee. Raccoons are known at least around my area for their horrific screams, which conveniently are heard most frequently in the middle of the night. I myself had never had the pleasure of hearing one of them in person before this encounter. If all of you readers are satisfied with this story, I would gladly keep going with this series, not forever, but I would hope to continue it for a decent amount of time. In the meantime, watch out for the screaming raccoons, my friends. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.